Welcome back to another edition of the Irish Breakdown Podcast, a little special Christmas Eve edition for everybody. We're so happy that you all are with us today. I I don't know what our numbers are going to be like today, Ryan, because I'm sure people are out and about, but I certainly appreciate all the people that that are with us today and just want to wish an early Merry Christmas to everybody out there that celebrates Christmas. We we do, and we're excited about it. going to be a nice, relaxing day. And, uh, but we're today, Ryan, Christmas Eve. What better topic to discuss today than Notre Dame football? And we're going to talk a little recruiting. We're going to dive into just the two year grades of Notre Dame. And, and we do have articles out about it. We're going to have some fun with recruiting over the next couple of days. I'm going to have our class superlatives article out that, you know, Ryan, Sean, and myself have kind of come up with, you know, best this, top that, predictions for this class. We'll have that up later today. That'll be fun. I'm going to release my class rankings. I thought about doing it in February, Ryan, but you know, I, I don't know if they're going to look for anybody. I think I'm just going to go and do that now. And then if I have to add people, I can add it and we can redo it in February. So still plenty of recruiting stuff to kind of clean up on. And uh, one of my favorite things to do, Ryan, is when you're evaluating recruiting efforts, I, I think it's, it's sometimes we can get a little bit lost in like there's, there's an importance to evaluating each class individually, but truly evaluating the direction that a recruiting operation is going is sort of taking it into two-year view. Because sometimes you may say, well, why'd you only sign two offensive linemen? Be like, well, we signed six last year, five the year before, and nobody's left, you know? So there's there's understanding the context of it. And I think the two-year grades is really a, my favorite way to really break down recruiting. And I think it's very interesting when looking at, at what we've seen in the last two years, Ryan, because there has been so much change in the last two years. You know, you had Marcus Freeman kind of coming in as the defensive coordinator and then just really skyrocketed recruiting on that side of the ball. Him and Mike Mickens have, have proved to be a very potent one-two punch when it comes to recruiting that position, for example. There are certain positions in the last couple of years defensively that Notre Dame has recruited as well as anybody in the country. There have always been positions on offense where that happens. But on offense, we went through a change where, I mean, your head coach leaves, who was an offensive guy. Your entire offensive staff outside of your quarterback coach slash OC leaves. You have some major departures from the from the from the uh, depth chart last year, and uh, and they kind of get into it. And and so you really look at it from this point of view, Ryan. And man, it's uh, it's been a a wild up and down ride. NIL becomes this huge thing. The transfer portal becomes this huge thing. And through it all, I think there's with little doubt, I'm going to say this, Ryan, Mm -hmm. Notre Dame has absolutely closed the gap in the last two years. Are they there yet? Is the gap erased? No, but they have absolutely on both sides of the ball when looking at it from a two-year standpoint, gotten themselves closer to that upper echelon of college football. Yeah. And I mean, we, that's one thing that we expected, right? Like you expect to recruit, obviously, at a high level at Notre Dame. But one thing that you were especially expecting when Marcus Freeman took over was that recruiting would take a somewhat different approach. You know, the standards don't change as far as getting the best possible players and recruits that you can that fit well into your program. But I think that we've all seen and we've heard from multiple people just outside of us, you know, from the national perspective that – have been very complimentary of Coach Freeman and his staff and the efforts that they put forth on the on the recruiting trail. So the, he was also, Brian, and I know we'll talk about this at some points, he was put into a situation, the staff in general, at certain positions, it was not well stocked when they got here, right? Like you talk about wide receiver, for instance, right, where it was like a huge emphasis in 2023 to get not only quality at receiver, but depth at receiver as well. So it's a little bit of a fun show because you're looking at the first of the two years was a completely different staff compared to the second, but that actually also makes it really fun in my opinion, because although it is, it's going to be a little bit of a difference of approach kind of comparison. It's also how the philosophy is building, right? What did the staff see that said, 
not only do we need to get numbers here, we need to change our emphasis of who we're going after, where we're going after them. So I think that this this show is going to be a lot of fun because not only are we going to talk about two very talented classes the last two years for Notre Dame and a lot of football players are going to be the future of the program and the reason that Notre Dame hopefully gets back to the precipice of college football. But it's also going to be fun because we're going to kind of expand upon what 22 was and where 2023 had to go and where it needs to continue to go forward. So we're evaluating a coaching staff in year one. We're evaluating a two-year period, and we're taking a look at where this roster sits now due to these last two classes and also, I think, getting a deeper understanding of where it still needs to go, right? Because this isn't this isn't a finished product. We know that there's still positions that need to get stronger. We know that there's still areas of the country that need to continue to be pipelines. There still needs to be emphasis put on different different parts of the country that haven't been before. But I think the one thing that we can all agree on is Notre Dame has brought in a lot of talent over the last two years, and it's exciting to kind of think about just some of these positions, especially that maybe haven't been as big as strengths to Notre Dame in the past, is now becoming bigger strengths now moving forward for the team. So I think when you when you look at it, Ryan, from the standpoint of the offense, right? Mm-hmm. I think that's the area we'll address first. Yep. And when I look at this offensive football team, Ryan, uh, you know, it's uh, this is the side of the ball that I think has has had the the big jump this mm-hmm. past year. You look at last year's offensive class, and the the problem with the offensive recruiting at Notre Dame has been it's been so wildly inconsistent. You know, I thought the 2018 recruiting class was really good. It didn't pan out, but at the time, I thought it was really good. You had Phil Dracovic, a quarterback. You had a really good wide receiver class. Kevin Austin, Braden Lindsey, Lawrence Keyes, Micah Jones, Joe Wilkins Jr., George Takis, and Tommy Tremble at tight end. I, I won't be shocked if both of those kids end up getting drafted. The mm-hmm. offensive, but but even that group, you, you had some big misses at running back. You ended up with Jameer Smith and – and uh uh, Sebo Flemister that were kind of late ads, you know, maybe good solid backs, but not big time guys. The offensive line class wasn't great. You had some projects. You end up missing out late on Nicholas Pettit Frere because of Harry Heastan leaving, you know, and then you end up with, with Jared Patterson, but the rest of the hall just wasn't, it wasn't a great offensive line year nationally. They took some chances on some projects, some guys with some high upside of Cole Mabry, who's a kid that I still feel like if he could have physically like held up, had some really good tools, but he was a, he was a low low floor high ceiling kid, right? Same with John Dirksen, was another guy that I thought had some tools, but there was some boomer bust to him, right? Well, in that year, it, it busted with both of them for different reasons, right? Cole Mabry, from what I was told, when he was playing his last couple of years, he was pretty good and was really coming along, but he just couldn't stay healthy. Just shoulder gave out and he couldn't stay healthy. But so he had some issues there. 2019, that class just really was a mess. You know, I mean, when, when you look at it, you end up kind of hitting a home run with Kyron Williams. But let's be honest, they didn't they didn't recruit that class thinking that Kyron Williams is going to be Kyron Williams. Let's be honest. Right. They missed out on a lot of guys before they went to Kyron Williams. If they thought Kyron Williams is going to be Kyron Williams, they would have gone after him earlier. Can, all right. So, let, so let's be let's be real about that. You had Cade McNamara in there early at quarterback. He ends up leaving. You miss out on Graham Merch. You decide to not take a couple other guys, like Max Dugan was a guy in that class they passed on. You end up with Brendan Clark. Again, boom or bust guy. Uh, you look at the the uh, rest of the class. I mean, your running back is, you said, Kyron, you had two receivers and Cam Hart and Kendall abdur that were kind of you know projectable guys. I loved Cam Hart's potential and upside. He was a really highly ranked guy for me. Kendall abdur was a quarterback that you were hoping you could convert into a wide receiver he ended up not panning out your offensive line class was really good really good offensive line class that year uh, it hasn't quite hit its mark in college but it's starting to you know Zeke Carell has kind of come along he's a pretty good player Andrew Christoffer could be bound for a starting job Quinn Carroll was a starter this past year at Minnesota <laughs> he's a good football player and then you know and then you could look at 2020 and 2020 is a home run Right. Or at least it appears to be a home run in some areas. You know, you, you, you look at quarterback, you get your pine, who was a relatively highly ranked kid, but was always going to be a game manager type. You have Chris Tyree at running back, Jordan Johnson at receiver, Xavier Watts at receiver. I loved both of those kids, especially Xavier Watts. You had Jay Bernos, a solid player, Michael Mayer at tight end. You had Kevin Bauman at tight end. But what happens? You end up coming up really short on the offensive line. You only get two guys and you strike out on like Zach Zinter. They decided to pass on Zach Zinter. 
Hindsight 2020, bad move, right? You end up with only two offensive linemen. And you had to flip Michael Carmody late to make it to the two offensive linemen because originally you're going to pass on him. Had a lot of misses in that class. Again, it's it, all those receivers are gone. They're either off the team or at another position two years in a row. You had recruiting classes in 19 and 20 where you don't have a single wide receiver left on the roster that actually plays wide receiver in those two years. And so, and then 2021, home run. Tyler Buckner, quarterback. Love the running back hall of Logan Diggs and Audric Estime. Wide receiver hall it ends up being really good receiver hall. Lorenzo Styles, Deion Colsey, Jaden Thomas. You got Kane Barong and Mitchell Evans at tight end. You have a really good offensive line class, which is kind of top heavy, right? But mm-hmm. Blake Fisher, Joe Walt, uh, Rocco Spindler. Like Joe Walt's kind of become Rocco, right? And then Rocco's become Joe Walt from a recruiting ranking standpoint. And then you had depth guys like Caleb Johnson and Pat Coogan. So the bottom of it wasn't as good, but really good. And then 2022, great offensive line class. You line a really, really good tight end class. And then Jadarian Price, but then you miss big on numbers at receiver. But the one guy you get, great player, Tobias Merriweather. You get a quarterback and Steve Angeli, who's a nice, solid game manager. But you see what I'm saying? Like, there was just never any consistency, Ryan. And there's yeah. always these big holes that would pop up. And so they come into this cycle. I'm setting the stage for you. Come into the cycle. You had high-end talent the last couple of years, but you missed out on some depth at some places. So this class needed to do two things. It needed to, to restock the depth chart. It needed impact players. Yeah. That's not always an easy thing to do, both of those in the same class. And this offensive staff absolutely knocked it straight out of the park when it comes to how they were able to put this class together uh, for just 2023 alone. So now you look at these two classes together, you got the high impact talent from last year and then the high impact talent plus the depth of this year. And these numbers are going to be pretty good. And Tommy Reese was finally given an offensive staff that top to bottom is made up of good recruiters, top to bottom. And this staff together went out, and I thought Ryan just did a great job of of kind of salvaging some of the areas where last year they came up short numbers-wise. And then both years had to overcome a lot of mistakes from past years. And they've Mm -hmm. gone a long way towards doing that, Ryan. So for me, I gave them an A-. And the reason why, because when it comes to two-year grades, an A grade has got to be really, really, really special. And I would say this is more of a – four to seven type of offensive hall. I don't think you're going to find more than three or four teams, maybe up to five that did better than this group did at, at just influxing talent. So I'm mm-hmm. going to edge on the side of being a little cautious and go a minus just because at some positions, the numbers are not quite where they needed to be. You didn't necessarily get impact in both years like some other teams did. So I'm going a minus, but still Ryan a minus in our standard is college football playoff caliber, borderline national championship. A is national championship caliber. This is borderline national championship caliber. Some guys got to pan out. But it's hard for me to not accept that number when you look at that they just hit. They've landed impact players at every single position the last two years. Mm -hmm. Well, and and I kept going back and forth on this one, Brian, because I think we're in the relatively in the same ballpark. You know, like for me, it was between an A minus and a B plus. Like I was kind of on the cusp and – it was a really close conversation. I ended up going B plus just because I, I felt like the 2022 class, and I know we'll get into more specifics of the positions. I feel like there was just a couple misses, you know, from the offensive class in general. One very important one that I felt like was a little underwhelming. And then when we get in the offensive line group, I'll explain why I was just a little bit lower on the offensive line group in 2022. Not so much because they didn't group really good football players, but because of how they all fit together and kind of the gamble that they're taking, maybe loading up on, maybe shoot more short things of interior players compared to the true offensive tackle types, which I think when combined with 2023 could be a little bit of trouble if a couple of those offensive tackles don't pan out and become true offensive tackles. So I think that the 2022 group for me just pulled it down slightly. So I ended up going with a B plus, but like it was an internal struggle. Like I literally sat, I like to write things down on a piece of paper sometimes because I'm kind of old fashioned in that, in that way. Right. And I was literally staring at this grade and just like, I want to do higher. And then I'm just like looking at a couple players from 2022 and I'm just like, but I just can't quite get there. Like I can't. So I am fully on board with the A minus that you gave. I ended up giving a B plus, but like it, I really had to talk myself into it because I am so excited about what the staff did in 2023 offensively. Like I 
Truly. I mean, yeah, there was, there's always a couple misses that you look at and say that could have taken it to the next level. Right. Of course. But I mean, for me, man, it, pretty much position by position, Notre Dame hit it up in, in the A range out of the park in 2023, which made it a really tough call for me. But it's just when we're talking about a two year span, there's just got to, when we put everything together, there's just a couple things that made me unsettled a little mm-hmm. bit. It could still work out, but it's just, it's not even a numbers game. It's just like positionally, how is it going right. to fit long term? Which I it's just it's a little bit of a back and forth for me. And, and as we get into the position, breakdowns i think some of that will be we'll be able to flesh some of that out but i think yeah. and, and we'll get into quarterback later but i think there are certain positions that are going to carry more weight mm-hmm. quarterback being one offensive line being another uh the quarterback grade when people will understand more of why you're going to be down at a b plus there yeah. and i'll say here's here's some reasons i went a minus over b plus right and then i'll also offer some reasons why i'm not pushing back on your b plus at all because first of all a minus b plus is like minor difference for me. The big thing for me is one of the needs that was met in both classes, even though it wasn't a numbers thing last year is offensively. They needed to, to sign impact players at the skill positions across the board, home run hitters, big time dudes. And even last year's class, even though it came up short in numbers, the fact that they got a player like Jadarian price now, for you, so y'all understand when we do these grades, it's based off what we view these guys as as prospects from a grade and an upside standpoint. So, for example, if we thought Benjamin Morrison was a lower ranked kid, but he has a freshman All American year, it doesn't it doesn't factor into this grade. Now, of course, we were very high on Benjamin Morrison, but the point is, it's based off where they were as recruits. We're trying to avoid as much as possible what has happened to guys as players. So, for example. I'm not bringing the running back grade down because Jadarian Price had an Achilles injury. The only place that'll be factored in is when the guy's not on the roster anymore. So like the offensive line class, we don't talk about Joey Tanona. Safety class, we're not going to talk about Jaden Bellamy because they're already off the roster. So it's a little bit of a, you know, kind of a a contradiction there, but it's just, it's certain guys just aren't there anymore. So I can't, we're not going to talk about them as being being on the class. Jadarian Price, has they come back from injury? I, I don't, I don't know. We'll see. But, when he signed, and what I think he can be is a flat out big time home run hitter. Jeremiah, mm-hmm. Jeremiah Love, flat out big time home run hitter. Receiver landed some big time home run hitters. Some guys can be go to guys, like A level, top 50 to top 75 caliber players. And they needed a lot of guys like that. I graded out looking at my grades. I had, let's see, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I had seven quarterback to tight end. Quarterback, running back, receiver. I had seven guys in, on my board that graded out as top 100 players on offense the last years, just at the skill positions, not even counting the offensive line, where I think I had three grayed out as top 100 players. Actually, two grayed out as surefire top 100 players. And then there's a lot of upside there too, Ryan. So to me, uh, there's a top 100 player at each of those five, each of those four positions, quarterback, running back, receiver, tight end. And at most of them, with the exception of quarterback, there's two of those type of guys now tight end there's only one but the the other two guys are top 150 to 200 type of guys so the depth is really good so that's why to me just that balance of difference makers raised the grade up a little bit and helped me overcome some of the the needs that were they were just a guy short as we'll get into at some positions and then also the the quarterback grade which we'll get into as well those are the things to me that raised up to an a minus but i also think the b plus is fair because they did come up short in some numbers at positions. They did come up short in a necessarily getting five guys that fit together real nicely, like receiver. Part of the reason we're both going to be so high on receiver is because of the, you know, the numbers are down, but what we like about it, what brings the grade back up is you've got guys can play together. Offensive line. There's some question marks there, Ryan. Like if those guys can play together in in a true five man group. So we'll get into that a little bit. But I think that the impact is why I bumped it up a little bit because that was what I considered a big need was an influx of impact skill players. And I think they got a lot, not just like one or two, and you hope those guys pan out. They got multiple impact playmakers uh, or guys that at least have the potential to be impact playmakers in the last two years. And that was the thing that kind of ro- rose it up for me a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I, I guess I – 
I guess I shouldn't have taken into account as much on what injuries look like with some of these classes at certain positions because I feel like maybe I factor that too much into some of my grades that I gave out, if I'm being honest. So I'll explain it a little bit when we get to, like, running back, for instance, when we get to, you know, a, a couple other positions where, unfortunately, there's just some injury stuff to kind of take a look at, right? Quarterback included in that if you go even further back to 2021, right? So – I think that I may have taken injuries a little too much into conversation uh, into the conversation because for me the injuries can can affect the margin for error based upon what the numbers now are, are. But it's going to be a fascinating thing just to kind of look at because I still think we're in the relatively same ballpark with our grading. It's just you know just we're individuals, right? So like there's some outside factors that just work right. a little bit. We're super close, Ron. We're B plus yeah, plus A minus. Right. That's why you and I don't talk yeah. about the grades until right before. And okay. I just have you give them to me because I don't want them to be where we negotiate and I need you to get on the <laughs> same page as me. It's part of the fun, right? Is explaining Absolutely. why we see a little bit differently. Where for me, great injuries come into account if it was something that was already there. So like Eli mm -hmm. Raritan's grade for me, the reason he was lower in the class for me. You know, I saw him as a top 100 guy, but he wasn't one of my top three or four guys like he was for some others is because of the knee injury that he had mm -hmm. in high school. Right. Now, he has obviously since re-injured, but that was already kind of a concern for me. So when guys had injuries in high school, that's, you know, like Brennan Vernon's a guy whose grade was just dinged a little bit because of he's had some nagging injuries. Nothing that's cost him time, but just some nagging injuries in some different areas. So I think that's where I take the injury part into to account. But I also Fair. did not give Ryan any criteria other than just trying to look at guys for high school because I want him to kind of have a fresh point of view on it. So sure. that'll make it uh, – It's but the thing that we agree on, Notre Dame flat out moved the needle with their offensive hall oh, from where they were. Are they where yeah. they need to be yet? No, they're not there yet. But they took a giant leap at most positions the last mm -hmm. two years combined. Yep. And that's that's a big part of it. Let's go to quarterback, Ryan. I think this yep. is an interesting one because this one is where our grades were were lower. I went B plus, but I was leaning towards B. Mm -hmm. You went B. Mm -hmm. And so we had another grade where I was a B plus, but I was leaning towards A minus. But I'm I'm trying to be a little bit more, okay, let me more often than not lean towards the lower grade. For me, part of the reason that I, I went B plus is I really think Kenny Minchie's a guy. And also, I think he is as good of a fit. So, for example, I graded Tyler Buckner out higher as a player coming out of high school than Kenny Minchie. Not by a ton. Mm -hmm. I have Kenny Minchie as like a 75 to 80 guy. In my preseason top 100, while he was still committed to Pitt, I had him ranked number 81 in the country. And as the number seven quarterback in a – if you got a top 10 quarterback in this class, you were getting a dude. Mm -hmm. and I graded Tyler Buckner as a top 50 guy. Here's the difference, however. Tyler Buckner, you had to project to eventually fit into Tommy Reese's offense. Kenny Mitch shows up day one fitting into Tommy Reese's offense. And so even though as an individual player, he doesn't grade out quite as high as me for me as Tyler Buckner, I think he's about as good. Of, he was one of the two to three best fits for this offense in the entire class mm -hmm. when you look at the, the best players. And to me, that is something that matters to me and is what is the reason I jumped my grade up for Kenny Minchie. I see a guy that has great arm talent. Now, not a powerful arm because arm talent doesn't always equal arm strength. Strong enough, it's arm talent. He's wicked smart. He can absorb a lot of volume from an offensive standpoint. He's a guy that can make plays with his legs, but he's preferred to use his leg to make plays with his arm. And he's a guy that brings leadership potential to the position. And then landing him – now raises Steve Angeli up in my view because now Steve Angeli is not necessarily in position to be a starter. If he is, it means he's a lot better than we think most likely. Sure. But now you put him in, in in a situation where he's a smart gamer with a lot of leadership traits, which makes him a really good backup. Steve Angeli is a potential future starter. Doesn't necessarily fire me up. And I hope the kid proves me wrong. We're just being fair with our assessment. But Steve Angeli is a backup to me brings more to the table, for example, than what Drew Pine brought to the table because he's bigger and has better physical tools than Drew Pine. He just doesn't have the experience. Drew Pine played a lot of football in high school. Steve Angeli didn't. You know, he's only was only a two year starter. And one of the years as a starter, he was the COVID year and he played like six or seven games. That's it. So he doesn't have a lot of experience, which kind of drags his grade down a little bit. 
but the physical tools are better than what Drew Pine did. So to me, that those two things bump it up. Where landing Kenny Mitchie and the fit he is now puts Steve Angeli into that sort of the backup quarterback role, and that's a really talented backup quarterback in my view. So that's why I lean towards B plus, even though for a while there I was kind of, uh, or that's why I went B plus, Ryan, even though I was leaning towards kind of a B plus for a minute. And and mm-hmm. so that's where my B plus came from. Talk to me about about what how you see court because now reminder people B in the B range is kind of like top it's like really good. It's in mm-hmm. the somewhere in the top 15 national range. Okay. So yeah. B is a really good grade on our scale. Uh it's just not elite. A is for elite, top five to seven type of group. And and so uh that's kind of where where we are. And that's why I mean Kenny Minchie's number seven in this class. It's hard for me to give an A or an A minus to a guy that wasn't even top five in his own class uh this year. So anyway, Ryan, explain yeah. explain yourself, sir. Why you have to be <laughs> Well, and this is where the the injury side kind of mixes in with my grade a little bit. And it's not with the two players that we'll be talking about specifically, right? It's not about Steve Angeli. It's not about Kenny Minchie. Because if I highlight both of the players for what they are for a second, I really like Kenny Minchie a lot. I think that Kenny Minchie could be a starting quarterback at Notre Dame. He could be a very successful football player if he pans out. And I think that his four is relatively high. I have been very, very forthcoming about my opinion on Steve Angeli. I agree with you. I think he has a good upside as a backup quarterback. I just feel like in the 2022 class, Notre Dame maybe could have gotten a little higher caliber of a player at that position. Or I don't even want to say a little higher. He could have gotten a a pretty convincingly higher caliber quarterback at that position, right? And you kind of settled. And settling isn't always bad because if I told you without the injury stuff in comparison that – you went from Tyler Buckner and Kenny Minchie two years apart, and then you got Steve Angeli in the middle. I think most people would be like, "Oh, that's that's good." You know, that's a good acquisition uh, acquisition of talent. But my what's holding me back, and what's a little different from, I guess, our perspective on the injury side of things, you know, because we didn't, you know, discuss it as much. But like now that we have, I, I know Tyler Buckner got hurt in high school as well, but now that we have serious concerns over Tyler Buckner, right, long term. You now look at this two-man quarterback class and you say, I think Kenny Mitchell's going to be really good, right? But if he isn't, then I yeah. think I'm in a little bit of trouble in this two-year yes. span, right? So that's where yes. I looked at it and I said, I think it's a B because I think that the upside is still there. But I think that the, the margin for error is just a little small for me, right? Because if Kenny Mitchell doesn't become the guy, then you're kind of like, well, now you have to really hope that CJ Carr is the guy when he comes in in 2024. Like he has to kind of be the savior almost yeah. of the three year class. I mean, but if you can guarantee me that Tyler Buckner could stay healthy, sure. Again, Which you not can. this conversation. That's the whole directly. point, exactly. Ryan. Like you exactly. can't, you yep. can't hypothetically say, well, part of my grade assumes that Tyler Buckner is going to stay healthy exactly. when he doesn't have that history of doing so. So you exactly. and I are both extremely high on Tyler Buckner's talent, okay. extremely high on his talent. But he's yeah. lost so much development time because mm-hmm. of the injuries. Exactly. And that has to be factored in. And so I think that is a fair thing to say where where I went, where it doesn't affect me, Ryan, is because I anticipate Notre Dame bringing in a portal quarterback. Sure. Which to me kind of – protects you in 2023 and i'm someone also looking to 2024 which Mm -hmm. probably unfairly and thinking cj you know with cj Carr coming in but the reason i feel the needs were met a little bit better is because i do still have a lot of faith in tyler buckner as a talent from a talent standpoint but also because i do anticipate them landing a a portal quarterback who have at least one year of eligibility left so that kind of factors into into that for me uh, so sure. I, I look, we 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 won't factor injuries into the current players that we're evaluating over a two year span, but we have to f- properly if, look at injuries if when we're looking at players that were signed before that span because that's where the needs that you have to meet come from, yep. right? Like that you say, well, hey, they signed so and so player who was great two years ago, but yeah, but that guy's not doing anything now because he's been nothing but injury prone the last two years. So we can't just look at Tyler Buckner and say, we both graded him as a top 50 recruit. Mm-hmm. Well, look, they signed a top 50 recruit two years ago. What? What? No, that's true, but we have to look at what he's done at Notre Dame now. Right. And what he's done at Notre Dame now is flash talent, but the inability to stay healthy. And yeah. even the game where he played a lot against Virginia Tech, the reason Jack Cohn came off the bench in that game was not because they needed him to rally the team. It's because Tyler Buckner got hurt. 
because he rolled his ankle. And that's why Jack Cant Cone came in and, and, and led him. He missed a game in 2021 or yeah, 2021 with an injury. Now, I was told he could have played through it if he was the starter. But mm-hmm. still, that has been there throughout his entire career. He's had one season in high school football and now two years of college football where he's been healthy the whole year. That's it. One. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to look at that. You have to look at it. It'd be irresponsible. It would be very biased towards mm-hmm. our opinion of his talent and potential to ignore that. You have yeah. to look at that. So I think it's fair to look at that, Ryan, and say, if Kenny, because like Kenny Minch is very talented, but is he a, a no-brainer, surefire right. Trevor Lawrence quarterback? No, that guy doesn't exist in this class, in my opinion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so you have to take that into consideration. The injuries before, and, and then also, right, Drew Pine leaving in the previous class adds yeah. to that as well. I look at it, the reason the B-plus for me is because I love the fit for Kenny Minchie. And then also, I, I do think the portal quarterback will help ease e- some of those depth concerns. And that that if they get a portal quarterback, which I anticipate, that also eases some of the need and the concern for Kenny Minchie to have to play as a freshman, right. which is not where I would want him to be. Could he do it? Sure. Do I want him yep. to be there? No. No, I do not. Right. right. Yep. I agree completely. And I think that that is a – again, because – I'm kind of rethinking my thought process here, Brian, because you made a couple great points, right? It's like if I'm looking a, a year back to evaluate Tyler Buckner, I should also look a year forward to CJ Carr being uh, fixed to that margin right. for error, right? So it's, it's a good conversation piece because I think that there's multiple ways to look at how these things work, right? Because I mean, there's you can't ignore what the what the facts of today are, right, when you evaluate players of the past because, like you said, you can't just look at – Tyler Buckner in a in a vacuum and be like, oh, it gives right. a top 50 player. Sure. Right. But he isn't anymore. It's like JT yeah. Daniels, right? JT Daniels was a stud coming out of high school. He's not right. that guy anymore. He's going to rice. rice now, right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Like he's not that guy. Right. So we need to be able to evaluate players now for what they are, not be, what our preconceived notion of them was when they first got to college because things right. change. They change very right. rapidly. Because by the time a guy gets into year two, Ryan, you can start to kind of say, once a guy has completed year two, he's no, you're no longer looking at him as a recruit. Like right. Tobias Merriweather not making a lot of plays this year. Uh, you know, it's fun. He's a freshman, right? There's a mm-hmm. lot of circumstances that go into that. Um, you know, uh, that's fine. If that's still the case in year two, then then there's a problem. So that's that's the whole right. thing is that's why, you know, year one guys, you can still look at them as, as recruits. It's year mm-hmm. two guys that is when you start saying, no, they're being evaluated as part of the as part of the team. Absolutely. So, Ryan, quarterback, I think we look at and say we both gave it what it, you gave it an A minus. We both gave it an A minus grade for 2023 by itself. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So I was A minus. I went C plus last year. I believe C plus is where I was for 2022 by itself. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I look at it. And so that that would actually be closer to a B than a B plus. So again, that's why I don't push back on your B grade. It's the portal, it's the portal uh aspect of it that is going to be impactful for me when I look sure. at it. So uh, I think we're very uh, we're we're very close in our grade for this one, no doubt about I think so it. Too. Yep. And just a, a quick question. We did we did have a super chat question that I want to address as we are as we are having these conversations. I think it's a good point, a good time to bring up now from Milton Fan Fifteen. Thank you for the super chat, Milton. Does character personality factor into your grades? Uh, it does, Milton. It does factor into it because when we do grades, that's part of the intangibles grade for me. So I have a grade. Uh, I have like eight different categories for players that I use for grades. Okay, and then the last one is intangibles. Intangibles for me really come down to to four things. Number one is injury history is part of that, right? And this is no order. Uh, Injury history has to be factored into a guy's grade. He could be a great player, but if he's never healthy, that has to be something that you can use to kind of bring that that grade down of just the skill set because the other parts are mostly about skill and technique and talent and size and things like that. So this brings that down. Production is part of that grade. Uh, Versatility is part of that grade. And then as much as we can evaluate it, personality and character is part of that grade as well. It's not a huge part because it's harder for us to really get to know these kids to that depth that like a Tommy Reese is going to get to know Kenny Minchie. But we also then reach out to sources and try to as best as we can to, to find out what kind of kids these are. So it does factor into the grades. And that's also 
uh, a big factor for why Kenny Minchie does grade as high as, as he does for me. That's one of those things that kind of negated the size thing. His size doesn't bother me like some. He's 6'2". That's plenty tall yeah. enough for me. But, you know, it, it kind of, you know, arm is good from a strength standpoint, but not elite. But sure. where he is elite, and this is why it's so important for a quarterback, even more so than other positions, everyone you talk to from Trent Dilford as high school coaches to Notre Dame coaches to other recruits to people that worked with him at Elite Le- elite 11s and the, the, the regional Elite 11, the national Elite 11, Elite 11, is this is one of the smartest kids you will find when it comes to football, right? He is wicked smart when it comes to quarterback play, and that is so important for Notre Dame's offense. We saw that with Ian Book. Somebody asked me, we were having a conversation about, you know, Sam Hartman. Does Sam Hartman, his arm compared to Ian Book's? And I was like, uh, it doesn't. I was like, I keep saying this. Ian Book had a really nice arm. Mm-hmm. He just didn't use it because he did. He never had the conviction because he was never great at reading defenses and absorbing a lot of offense and then being able to carry it out on Saturdays. And it always masked what I felt were actually pretty impressive physical tools. Mm-hmm. And and so I think that's part of the reason he got picked in the fourth round like he did is because this kid can spin the ball pretty good. He just doesn't yeah. have the the mind of – he just doesn't process information real quick. Right. Mm-hmm. Kenny Minchie does. And that's something that, especially for a quarterback, is every bit as important to me as arm talent. Because if you have all the arm talent in the world, but if you can't read defenses, you're not going to be a very good quarterback. Right. Mm-hmm. And you may, may have a somewhat mediocre arm, but if you're a wicked smart quarterback, you're going to be a great quarterback. Case in point, Mac Jones versus Trevor Lawrence. Right. Now, Trevor Lawrence has all the physical tools in the world. Right. And, and now he has the mind too, right? So I'm just making a point. Mm-hmm. He has all the physical tools you want and the mind you want. So, of course, he's going to be a great player and a great talent. Then you look at Mac Jones, completely opposite physically. Doesn't have the body, doesn't have the arm, doesn't have any of the physical tools, can't run. None of the physical tools that Trevor Lawrence had. But he's a great college quarterback who won a national championship and was a top first-round draft pick. Why? Because he had what he lacked physically, he can make up for here. That's not happening at running back, Ryan. That's not mm-hmm. happening on the offensive line. You, you that's not happening at corner and safety. You have to have a level of physical superiority to be a great player at every position except for one, and that's yeah. quarterback. It's so true. But that's that's like when we, um, you remember when we did the talking point, I think it was on a mailbag where someone's, you know, we were talking about the, you know, Notre Dame's goal is to get longer and more athletic at each position. Right. And I kind of stopped at the quarterback. I'm like, well, kind of, but like, it doesn't matter that much a quarterback. Right. It's like, it's such a mentally driven position to your points. Right. Like I, for every Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen out there, there's the Tom Brady's Peyton Manning's and Drew Brees's of the past generation. Right. Who were not incredibly physically gifted, but they won because, and they were so great because they saw the game at such an advanced level, right? And you knew every single day Peyton Manning was coming to work and he was working his tail off to be the best possible player he could be. And those traits matter a lot. And, I, I, again, I, that's why the when you do a, a scouting report on a quarterback, it can be so interesting because there's some quarterbacks that even I've graded from an NFL draft perspective – or if you look at just like the physical traits attributes and kind of add those grades up in your head, you're like, oh, that's not nearly as high as the grade you gave them. And I'm just like, yeah, because that's that's our, that's secondary stuff usually. Like it really is. I mean, is it nice to have Josh Allen's arm? Absolutely. Is it nice to be as athletic as Lamar Jackson? For sure. But you don't have to have those things in order to be great at that position because it's about that anticipation. It's about seeing the game. It's about being a leader controlling the huddle, right? So quarterback is a imperfect science from an evaluation perspective because it doesn't come down to arm length and, you know, 40 time and and those quantifiable traits. So Ryan, much how many times is, have we seen great corners or great receivers that were flat-out head cases? Exactly. But yeah. at the end of the day, they're just physical freaks that can just go out there and be great players. And mm-hmm. that can never happen to quarterback. Yeah. Jamarcus Russell had one of the most powerful arms I've ever seen in my life. He was one That's of the insane. worst quarterbacks I've ever seen in my life. Why? Here and here. Simple yes. as that. 
Yep. And and you just you can't you can't get away with that at quarterback. You can't mm-hmm. you can't be that kind of guy. That's why Jeff George was never the player he should have been. Um, you know, I mean he he was a guy that that to me had all the physical tools to be great, but there was something about him that never let him become that guy. Remember right. Jim Druckenmiller? It was a first round pick. <laughs> yeah. from, he had a huge arm, mm-hmm. but he just didn't have the feel for the game. Right. And and so those things are are whether it's character or mind or whatever, some guys can be really mechanical and mm-hmm. you know, it just, it doesn't work. It, it just doesn't work. I, I think of a guy like a Jay Cutler too, man. Yeah. Jay Cutler oh, yeah. could throw the ball through a damn wall. That dude had right. a bazooka for an arm and he was a good athlete too. Sure. And he came for Vanderbilt. So everyone had this assumption that he's just this really sharp, smart dude. And in the classroom, I'm sure he was, but right. on the football field, man, it was just mistake after mistake right. and just something just that you can't process. Quantify. Well, he, he couldn't yeah. process the things and, and be a great decision maker. So exactly. that's one of the things that has me so high on Kenny Minchie is because he does check all the boxes for those mm-hmm. areas. Yep. And that's why, you know, you, 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 people say, well, you know, I look at his film and he doesn't blow me away with physical talent. I'm like, yeah, me neither. He's got good physical talent, but he's not a mm-hmm. top five national quarterback just from a – there's a dozen guys in the country with better arms than Kenny uh, Mitchie. Oh, yeah. yeah. Maybe more. But that's not what goes into being a great quarterback. Exactly. You know, and, and there's so much – give me a Kenny Minchie over Jaden Rashada any day of the week. Rashada mm-hmm. has top two to three player in the country physical tools. Cannon. If yeah. not number one, Right. It's him and to me, him and Nico are in competition for just, just most physically gifted. Jacob Robinson's in that conversation for me. Jacoby mm-hmm. Robinson, right? Mm-hmm. But yes. they can't compete in my what, – what puts Kenny on the level of those top two guys is because he makes up for it in those other areas that are so vitally important to being a yeah. quarterback. Because Tua Tungvalu had better physical tools than Mac Jones, but Tua never won a title. Mac did. Because Matt could execute that offense at a precision that just was exceptional. And, and you know, he had good talent around him. But the point is not to disparage Tua. It's just mm-hmm. all the physical talent in the world can only take you so far. And a lack of those schools, lack of that talent is not as limiting as, as, as having a lack of talent up here. And that's what we love right. about Kenny Mitchie. Let's move on to running back, Ryan. Mm-hmm. A for me. So I, you look at what they signed last two years. Uh, you signed Jabron Payne last year. You signed Jaren uh, Price last year. And you signed Jeremiah Love this year. The injury concern for me is not Jaren Price because I'm not factoring it in. I don't want us to factor that in. But you look at Jabron Payne, and I think his injury history does impact yep. me. Now, I love the talent, but I can't ignore the fact that for his last two years, he was barely healthy as a high school football player. But for me, when I look at this one-two punch of Jadarian Price and Jeremiah Love, I can't tell you the last time that Notre Dame in back-to-back years landed home run hitters like this. It's been a long time. This is as explosive as a one-two punch as you're going to find. So in back-to-back years, Notre Dame landed top 100 running backs. And that can't be dismissed, man. It Mm -hmm. can't be dismissed. So home run for me. And the other part, too, is – when I look at it is fine, you got three running backs, but you can't play three running backs together. Actually, yeah, you can play at least two of them together and maybe three because I could see a scenario three years from now where they do this crazy 31 personnel group where you've got Jadarian Price and Jeremiah Love in the backfield and Jabron Payne out there in the slot, right? And and you're doing some funky things with that and having some fun with that as just a change-up type of personnel group. But the fact that Jadarian Price and Jeremiah Love are both legitimately impactful pass catchers mm-hmm. means you can use them together in different looks. Jeremiah Love could easily line up outside. And Jadarian Price in high school was another guy that, I mean, there's plays in his high school film, Ryan, where he's running backside seam routes, catching the ball over the shoulder in high school. You know, mm-hmm. like he's a legit pass catcher too. Uh, so both of those kids bring that pass catching acumen pass blocking acumen i think that's one of the most underrated parts of jeremiah loves game is he is a legitimately good pass blocker in high school and they even used him at times as a lead blocker for the running back now i got to question that uh, strategy where you're giving the ball to somebody else and asking <laughs> jeremiah the love to block for them i got to question your coaching strategy but hey they want to say championship so hey it is what it is right but he was a legitimately physical blocker at his at his high school level now you're not doing that in college but the point is 
they felt comfortable enough about his physicality to step up and take on blocks that they used him in, in that role. So yeah. I think that factors in too. So home run hitter, check. Depth, check. Versatility, check. Meeting numbers needs, check. Uh, I, I, I know why you're going to take it down a bit, and so I'm going to let you address that last part of it uh, when it comes to the other part. But for me, when I look at the skill and just the numbers that I felt the staff needed, I think they absolutely knocked it out of the park. And I, I look around the country and I don't see many teams that in a two year span signed a running back tandem that I would look at and say, yeah, I'd trade Notre Dame's guys for those guys. I don't. And that includes Bama's two man group this year of Richard Young and Justice Haynes. I would not trade those two for Jeremiah Love and Jadarian Price because I think Jer- Jadarian Price brings sort of the same skill set that those two guys bring to the table. Jeremiah Love is by far the most explosive of all of all of all, of, of the Bama guys and is evolving as an every down back. So, you know, the the floor may be higher for those two kids at Bama, but the ceiling's mm-hmm. not. And that's what has me fired up about what Notre Dame's adding at running back. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think first and foremost that Jeremiah Love is a top 50 player in the 2023 recruiting class nationally. I think he's that special of a football player. I think when you're talking about the size at about six foot one, 195 plus pounds. Has some physicality to his game, and I think it's only going to improve. He's got some breakaway speed, pass catching ability. I I think he's an all around type of running back that he could be a legitimate three down player on the next level if you need him to be. Now I don't think Notre Dame will need him to be throughout the majority of his career because that running back room is so loaded, man. I mean, just so many guys, right? I let I honestly left Jabron Payne out of this conversation a little bit, Brian, because I just I don't know what to expect from him. I don't. I mean, and, and I I hope I mean there is a lot of really incredible film of him when he was a sophomore. You know, like you could fall in love with that stuff and be like that guy could be a dude if he stays healthy. But the problem is, is he just hasn't been. I mean, I I don't think he had any injury setbacks this year, but he wasn't really playing a ton, obviously, right outside of a couple kickoff return duties during the Syracuse game, but you know, missed the previous two, the majority of the previous two years with injuries and they were, you know, pretty significant injuries too. So I kind of just left them out of the conversation. Again, it's unfair of me to a degree, but if, if Jadarian Price had a ACL injury, for instance, this year, I wouldn't really bat an eye at it uh, because ACLs guys get back so quickly from those types of injuries. But the fact that it's an Achilles does have me a little worried, just slightly. It, it does, you know? It does a little bit. If it again, if it was an ACL or a PCL or something else, like I get that, that. But we're yeah. looking at it as rec- what they signed, right? Sure. And so, to me, I, the way that this is set up, you can't look at it that way because otherwise, mm-hmm. you're going to say like, "Where was he when he signed?" You know right. what I mean? Now you can look at it from the standpoint of, did, "Do you need more guys because of the injury?" Sure. Uh, right. But because we don't know how he's going to be injury wise, Tyler Buckner is a little different because number one, he's now two years into this and mm-hmm. we have a more extensive history of those injuries. Sure. But that's why for me, I, I'm just, I, I'm not going to factor the running back piece into that just because, you know, because I, I don't think that we can, we can know for sure how he's going to come back. But I think it's a fair thing to talk about uh, when you look at, should they have then gotten a second back in this class? Right. Well, they felt they wanted a second back, not to the point where they were just going to go f- search for one. And when they when they knew they were going to lose Lamar, they decided, hey, we're good to go. But mm-hmm. they wanted one. They wanted a second sure. back for some reason. Right. But Jabron Payne's thing is is there. I f- you have to factor Jabron Payne in for me because if he's healthy, you got a four star running back, a third four star running back in this class. But as far as does having him boost the grade, it's hard for me to do so. The kid didn't even rush for 1,000 yards his last two years because right. of all the injuries. And barely rushed for 1,000 yards in, in three years because of the injuries. And, you know, he was pretty good as a sophomore. So the healthy film is impressive. But mm-hmm. that helped, the last healthy film we saw was his sophomore year of high school. Exactly. And so yeah. it's hard to really use him to – uh, to bump up that. Now, if he were the number one back in that class, that would be a different deal. Mm-hmm. But for me, um, it, it doesn't bring the grade down because, A, he wasn't a need. Because remember, they signed two backs in 2021. Uh, mm-hmm. So the depth chart is healthy, very healthy. I mean, if they had signed Jay Lamar, they'd have seven running backs on the roster in yeah. 2023. That's too many. 
You know, right mm-hmm. now they're at a healthy number, and Jabron Payne did stay healthy this year. He did. You know, playing scout team and getting some other time and things like that. So he was able to be healthy. We've heard some good things about him, but I'm not going to use that to then negate his high school injuries because it's one thing to stay healthy in practice for a whole year. It's another thing to be the back on Saturday that's getting 15, 20 carries a game and staying healthy. Right. And that's what we need to see more from him, in my opinion. So I think the injury stuff is fair. I'm just – to stay consistent with how this goes – because if we're not going to bump the corner grade up because of Benjamin Morrison being a freshman All-American beyond what we already thought of him, then I'm mm-hmm. not going to bring a grade down because a guy didn't pan out as a freshman or because a guy was injured as a freshman, unless it is a potentially debilitating injury, which is your concern about Jared Darren, which is why it's right. fair to go right. there. It's not just a, you know, had a concussion and missed two weeks or something like that. So I understand sure. where you're coming from. I do. I yeah. do. I'm just trying to, in order to be consistent, not focusing as much on that. I understand. But, I totally get it. But from a number standpoint, it's hard not to ignore it when you look at the potential of maybe should they have brought in a second back this year. But I think once they got a commitment from Aeneas Williams in, in really early November, I mean, he committed in December, but as we've reported here, he gave them a silent commitment in, in November, the weekend of the Clemson game. Yeah, I think that was when the staff decided we're good. We're good now with this class. And then if we need another back, we'll go get one in 2024 is yeah. where they'll go. So that's where I, they're at. I, I'll tell you what, though, man, if Janarian can't come back from injury, just outside of this conversation for a second, I agree completely with you in the sense that seeing Janarian Price combined with Jeremiah Love from a home run hitting perspective over yeah. the next few years is going to be stupid, man. It's going to well, be Let me ask you that, Ryan. Let's say yeah. he didn't have let's say let's say you took the criteria that I have set, yeah. right? And say can't factor in injuries from what they've done in the first year just like you can't yeah. factor in play or lack thereof just where they were when they signed. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. What would your grade be then? Would it be uh, an A or would you still be it, A minus? No, nah, it, it would it would 100% be an A. Okay. I wouldn't even think twice about okay. it because the thing that separates those players for me is they're also not just home run threats, right? They're also guys that are physical enough and have power profile developing that they both could be the lead back if everything worked out, right? Like they, it's, there's no, it's not like they're, we're talking about two just compartmentalized backs who can only handle 10 to 15 carries. I think that legitimately, Moving forward, if Jadarian Price gets back healthy and Jeremiah Love completely continues to fill out his frame, that those guys could be 20 carry guys down the line if you needed them to be on top of the work that they can do in the passing game. And I think both could be good run, run, uh, run block, um, pass blockers, pass protectors as running backs as well. So if you the injuries were not in the conversation at all, in my mind, I mean, I <laughs> like you said with the Richard Young, Justice Haynes versus, you know, the last two running backs in this previous two years. I'm not sure I would trade with anybody in the country. I really don't because I think that Jadarian Price and Jeremiah Love together could be a lethal combination that yeah. we haven't seen at Notre Dame in some time, right? Because even the group that we have now with Aldrick Estime, Logan Diggs, Chris Tyree, it's a great trio of running backs, man. A really great dynamic one-two punch as well. But they are so good because they work well off of each other's traits, right? Off of each other's strengths. But they're not really – I think that Logan Diggs has some three-down potential to kind of be an all-around back. But Audrey Gaston is not really an all-around back, right? But Jeremiah Love can be an all-around back, a guy that plays all three downs, can catch the ball consistently yeah. and be the pass protecting stuff. Jadarian Price is the same way. Like I don't think you ever have to supplement any part of either one of their game to be better in an area. They could be those guys in my opinion. Yeah, I for me, Ryan, I think yeah. they're all I think they're all every down backs. Mm-hmm. I think every kid that they sign with the exception of Jabron Payne is an every down back. By every down back, I mean you can put them in their first, second, third down and use them. I think a logic estimate to your point, I I I, I was a, I was initially going to push back on you cuz I kind of mm-hmm. took you saying all around is every down. Not, no. not, not, you can explain that that's not what you're saying. You are correct. He he can his production in the pass game. I think Audra can be a weapon in the pass game, but it's how we've seen them: pass blocker, swing passes, angle routes. That's mm-hmm. good. Catch it and run That's people over. Yeah. What I just make sure where I think you're saying all around is more guys that can be like legitimate like weapons out of the backfield, meaning they can line up in the slot, they can run wheel yes. routes, they can they can run seam routes, they can do different things beyond just catching a screen, catching an angle, checking mm-hmm. catching a swing. Is that basically yeah. what you're okay? That makes that make I'm with you on that. I think they're all every down backs. 
It's just you're going to use Audric Estime on every down differently than you're going to use Logan Diggs on every down. And then Jeremiah exactly. loves you, Darren Price. Okay. Yep. We're on the same page. On the same page. And the thing I, I would agree with you too is I think Jeremiah Love absolutely can be a 15 plus touch a game guy. He, sh- I, I wasn't sure about that as a junior. He showed me he can be mm-hmm. as a senior, in my opinion. Yeah. And he's just, he's still got a lot of filling out to do. I, I also agree with your point. You, you're not going to need him to do that all the time because of how yeah. deep you are. But so he's going to be one of those guys that you're like, dude, if he's not getting 12 to 15 touches a game in some capacity, you're just not doing this thing right. And then the pushback's going to be, but yeah, but I could say the same thing about Janarian Price, and I can say the same thing about Aeneas Williams. So like, it started with Lance Taylor. It's continued with Dylan McCullough. But Notre Dame in the last couple of years and moving forward is recruiting running back as well as I've ever seen it. Re- going back to, I mean, since the Lou Holtz era. Because back then they were signing like five running backs a year because – Back then, you'd sign running backs and move them all over the field. It, it was not it was not as specialized as it is today. But, mm-hmm. I mean, not since Lou Holtz was here have I seen Notre Dame string together Tyree, I mean, I mean, Kyron Williams, Chris Tyree, Diggs and Estime, uh, just Price and Payne, and then Love in that many classes in a row. Mm-hmm. And especially in 2020 with, Ty, with Chris Tyree. I mean, just you know, that was a big win. You beat Bama and Oklahoma for him. You know, yeah. you beat LSU at the end for Logan Diggs. You had to, you know, there's a lot of schools. You got on on Price early, but and then a lot of schools like Texas and other schools started getting in on him late when he blew up as a senior and you held off. And then, of course, Jeremiah Love, you had to beat everybody for him. <laughs> so they're not just getting sleepers like Kyron Williams that nobody knows about and become great players. They're beating dudes for the kids that they've landed the last few years. And, and when you count Aeneas Williams, so you go Jadarian Price to Jeremiah Love and Aeneas Williams – I mean, when has Notre Dame in three straight years gotten three backs like that that can win in space the way that those three can win in? You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. it's those are guys that you design touches for and just get them out in space, right? Like you said, run wheel routes, run angles, run screens, outside, inside zone. Like, it, you just want to get guys like Love, Price, and Aeneas Williams in space and just let them work, man. And I – I, can't, I don't think that's happened in my lifetime, Brian. Like, I can't think of three back to back to back years where you got players with that type of skill set at running back. Like, true guys Th- there, that there you was. can line up almost we, anywhere. You were younger. Yeah. 06, yeah. they got James Aldridge. Mm-hmm. 07, they got Armando Allen and Robert Hughes. 08, mm-hmm. they got, um, I think it was Jonas Gray. And then in 09, mm-hmm. they got Sierra Wood and, and Theo Riddick. That was the last time they recruited like this, in my opinion. Yeah. And Armando, before uh, before Armando got injured as a junior, he was one of Stud. the most explosive players I've ever seen. He won the hundred meter right. state championship in Florida. Uh, <laughs> end of end of point. How explosive he was. Robert Hughes is a top hundred guy. Jonas Gray was top hundred guy. James Aldridge was a five star. I never thought he was a five star. He was really good, but injuries mm-hmm. were just a big reason for a lot of those guys. And some of them happened in high school. James Aldridge yeah. got hurt in high school. Armando got hurt in high school. And, and so those were some things, but that, there was a lot of talent in that group. But it, that's mm-hmm. the last time you can go to, to this, really, is, is, is this group. And even then, the explosiveness of that, that was talent was as good as it is now, but the mm-hmm. explosiveness was not. That there, was, there was one guy that was explosive as those guys, and that was Armando, and he was sort of damaged goods by the time he showed up, right? right. Um, then you have to go – that was 07. Then you'd have to go to 09 – to get to Sear Wood, but Sear Wood wasn't as fast as these two kids. He was a home run hitter, but he wasn't as fast as these two kids. So mm-hmm. back to back explosiveness, it that that's just explosiveness period. That's been a long time. You have to go back to the Lou Holtz era for that. But it just yeah. the stretch of running back recruiting, just high quality. We saw in the Charlie Weiss era, who was known as a great. But that's the point. Didn't we always say if if you could recruit like Charlie Weiss on offense, but then recruit like. You know, Marcus, I've heard people say, if you could have a recruiter like Charlie Weiss on offense and then somebody like Marcus Rue on defense, boy, this team's going to be pretty good. Well, say whatever you want about Tommy Reese. But since he has given been given resources, it's kind of like the knock that people – I used to get in this argument with people about John Elway. Well, Elway only won Super Bowls when he got Terrell Davis. And so, I'm like, yeah, exactly. Meaning like when like Joe Montana had like Jerry Rice and John Taylor and <laughs> Roger Craig, right? Name me a – you know, when Troy Aikman had Emmett Smith and Michael Irvin – Every great quarterback that wins multiple Super Bowls had great players around him. John Elway was the only exception of guy that got to the Super Bowl. Could you imagine if John Elway had the weapons that Jim Kelly had and the defense that Jim Kelly had, with all due respect to Jim Kelly? They don't go 0-4 in the Super Bowl. I can promise you that, okay? Well, that's kind of thing with Tommy Reese is forget the offensive coordinator concerns or developing players, just looking him as an OC. 
he has been the one person, him and Chad Bowden as a tandem have combined to be pretty flipping good the last two years. And then when you add the new staff together, if they can keep this group together for the most part for a couple more years, you're not going to find many teams in the country, if any, that are going to be able to stack offensive talent across the board like this group has. And that's the point. Let's get to receiver to continue that whole point, Ryan. And mm-hmm. I think wide receiver recruiting is a perfect example of that. But the talent, there's two ways to look at receiver recruiting, Ryan. Last two years, they've signed Tobias Merriweather, who I graded out as a top 50 national recruit. This year, they signed Braylon James, who I graded out as a top 100 recruit with five-star upside. They landed Jaden Greathouse, who, was, who I graded out as a top 100 recruit with five-star upside. They landed Caleb uh, Smith, who I graded out as a top 250 player. They and they landed Rico Flores, who I grade out as a top 250 player. They have we have seen a big influx of this five man group into onto the Notre Dame roster. So from a pure talent standpoint, to me, this is an A group. Th- there mm-hmm. aren't many people that have signed a group of five like this. You three or four, right? LSU's had some pretty good ones. Bama's had some good ones, but Bama's already lost a couple of their dudes from last year, which would count yeah. and factor in like we do. JJ. Uh, JJ or JoJo Early's uh, transferred from them, for example. Mm-hmm. So this group is there. It, it's it's certainly recruited at a very high level. The pro, the th- but that's one part. But the po- problem is, as much as that five man group is impactful for me, and and we have to talk about this part first. I still gave it a B plus grade mm-hmm. because the numbers were. It was almost going to be impossible after last year's one man group to re- completely get your numbers back on track in one recruiting cycle it would have been to the point where you know signing five or six you could have done it with dylan edwards because he was kind of a hybrid guy not just a pure receiver but it would have been hard to sign five pure receivers in one class and then keep them here it it just would have been hard i think four was the ideal number of pure receivers in this class they hit that number but the fact is is you came up two dudes short last year and that's the thing that drags it down. So we'll get the negative out of the way first, Ryan. You had a B plus as well, and it yeah. was for the exact same reason. Just completely, Maureen Walker losing him, whatever. I didn't think he's that good of a player. But losing C.J. Williams late in the stre- late down the stretch really hurt last year's class. Not taking a slot guy, uh, losing Caleb Brown, out on Caleb Brown, losing out on some of the other receivers that you went after, and only getting Tobias, who, again, dude, top 50 guy. But – you needed at least one more guy. If they'd have got CJ Williams, I still would have said four is the need in this class. And that's the point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's where the numbers conversation gets a little tough because it's also combined with what the previous staff had left, right? Especially because you mentioned the you mentioned the previous two classes besides that, right, Brian, where none of those players had are playing wide receiver for Notre Dame anymore, right? Like you have Cam Hart that's playing cornerback for Notre Dame as one of the wide receiver recruits from a few years ago. So the wide receiver position has been a huge need, not even from a, just continuing to add talent from a numbers perspective. And you got numbers this year. You got four, and that's an awesome four-man class in my opinion. I think that is a tremendous, tremendous group with Jaden Greathouse, Braylon James, Caleb Smith, and Rico Flores Jr. Like, I think that that is tremendous. But the fact that of where the wide receiver group was coming into this class – you have to consider it a little bit, right? Because now, now you're you're working off of the 2022 class where, yes, we, th- we both think that Tobias is going to be a really good player. There's no doubt. But there's nobody else in that group to grade, right? You missed. You missed numbers. That's point blank period to it. You're going into next season now where you need that four-man class. You need that. It's a necessity now because you only have four scholarship receivers coming back from the team from the 2022 season. So, this is more a – this isn't even more a – look, 2020 – the 2022 class is, you know, Brian Kelly's final cycle and then and then Marcus Freeman puts his finishing touches on the end and keeps the group together, right, blah, blah, blah. This year is his first true class. And I think that the reason that this is push, getting pulled down is because of the, the shortcomings of what the previous staff had done at wide receiver more than anything, right, because there is a giant need – for now guys to come in and play immediately, which I think we both think that Jaden Greathouse is up to the task. I think we both, as long as he's healthy, we I think we both feel that Rico Flores could give you that opportunity to play pretty early on in his career. 
I think that we both think that Braylon, Braylon James in the right situation. I almost called him Braylon Edwards, by the way. How I never am going to mention a Michigan player on this podcast. So, but I mean, he could play early in a specific role, in my opinion. But the matter of fact is, is that where it was getting these numbers this year was a necessity because the 2022 class came up so short on numbers. So this is the shortcomings of the previous staff. But when we're evaluating where the roster is and where it needed to be. It's just the numbers that really kind of hold it back, in my opinion. That's it. It's just the numbers. I, I love the point you made because it's it's not Chancey Stuckey that's the reason for the no. B+. Because no. I gave that – I believe I gave the receiver class an A. Mm-hmm. I believe that was the grade I gave them. I'm going to just pull that up just to be sure because I don't want to say something that's inaccurate. But I'm pretty sure I gave the receiver class an A for this cycle. Yes, I did. I gave them an A because – this class did everything it could to get the roster where it needed to get to. It was last year's short, shortcomings, which were Adele Alexander problem, not a problem for the offensive staff, in my opinion. I want to bring tight end into this conversation now too, Ryan, because I think looking at these two guys together is important because the tight end is such an important part of the Notre Dame pass game. I think you have to yeah. factor that into the conversation as well. And, you know, you and I talking before the show – actually has kind of caused me to go back and actually look at my grade for the tight mm-hmm. ends because I gave the tight end to, to the, the two year grade at tight end. I gave it an A mm-hmm. and, and I think looking back on it, cause I had kind of said to myself, like, look, I'm, I've got to stick to my rule of not using injuries as uh, that happen now into the, the equation. But mm-hmm. the reality is, is the injury that, 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 Eli Raritan had now was a re-injury of what he had in high school. So I actually just sure. went back and changed my my grade uh to your grade to an A minus, which is where yours was. So well done yeah. on causing on you know on on just kind of that that discussion that we had. And it wasn't a quick discussion, but from a pure talent standpoint, I love this group. Mm-hmm. It's a very versatile group. Eli Raritan is a bit of a do-everything kind of guy, which is why he's the only top hundred guy. Holden Stace has a ton of upside, but he came to Notre Dame very raw, you know, needing a lot. And we saw that this year. I mean, he, he, the physical tools are obvious. The technical tools are where he needs a lot of work, right? Uh, and then Cooper Flant, and he's more of the H back, you know, wing, kind of that F position, move around, line up in the slot, do a lot of the pass game stuff. And then Cooper Flanagan is more of a traditional Y. He is a traditional tight end. And then Eli can do it all. So I love this group talent-wise. I think they met all their needs from a, a a standpoint of of numbers. I think they hit it all. I just think the the rawness of Holden Stace, yeah. the fact that Cooper Flanagan doesn't have a ton of production, not his fault. It's just the high school he came from that has to be factored in, and the fact that only one of the three, which was Raritan, who had a knee injury, a, a torn ACL, uh, graded out as a top hundred recruit. I think my initial grade was too high. And so I, I did take it down to an A minus, and mm-hmm. uh, but still a very good haul, Brian. But oh, the yeah. thing about it is these guys are all some type of weapon in the pass game, mm-hmm. which when you look at the receiving core, I think here's the saving grace for Notre Dame. We just talked about the receiver class getting a B plus because of numbers, because of mistakes of the past staff, right? The fact is, is the when you look at building a team, the depth and talent at tight end and the impact talent at, 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 in the pass game at running back is why you can still put a championship offense on the field together with these two groups. That right. that can't be dismissed, right? And because you can use a Jeremiah Love in, in the slot, because you can use a Jadarian Price if he comes back in that role, because you can go 12 personnel a lot and be legitimate pass-catching weapons, the fact that you sign these three tight ends and the style that they bring to the table, holding Stace, uh, as a 12th personnel can do a lot of receiver type of things is mm-hmm. why even though the grade of receiver is down a bit, I think the overall looking at this group together as a whole bumps it up. And so if I were to say, okay, let's put the receivers and tight ends together in, you know, in a great, it's clearly an A minus, if not mm-hmm. a borderline A with just the, I mean, excuse me, running back, running back receiver and tight end. If we're just going to look at like skill together, just as a whole, it's an A minus borderline A because of the fact that those other two position groups can do a lot of the things that other teams need receivers to do. And right. that helps lessen some of the blow of the fact that they didn't meet their numbers needs. 
That's important to discuss. No, it is. It is. And and I love, but I love your conversation about the tight end side of it, right? Brian, from a just scope into that room just in general, because I the the reason that I really like the last two, but I have some question marks is something that you hit on already. Out of the three players, Eli Raritan, Holden Stace, and Cooper Flanagan, I think there's one football player in that group that it can be a high-impact player in both areas, right? Both as a pass catcher and, a, and as a blocker. That's Eli Raritan. The problem is, is that injuries have kind of made him a little bit of a question mark. And I think Holden High school Stace, injury. Not, exactly. Even if we're exactly. going to stick to my criteria of we're not yep. going to really focus on what happens in college, the high yep. school injury, torn ACL, exactly. it's not something to sniff about for a kid who's 6'7". No, it's not. It's not. And then you, because then you have two football players who are both very gifted. And you know, I love Cooper Flanagan as a oh, football yeah. player because of what he does in the run game. Like, I think that he has a very high floor for as good as he is as a run blocker. But the fact of the matter is, for me, is that I think Holden Stace could be a high impact player as a receiver, but I haven't seen enough as a blocker, even in high school, for me to say he could also be a high impact player as a blocker. Cooper Flanagan's the reverse. He could be a high impact player in the run game, but can he be a high impact player in the passing game on the college level? I'm not sure about that yet. You know, like I think he could be a Troy Nicholas type of pass catcher for Notre Dame, but I need to see it, right? Like it's just not something that was, and it's not no fault of his own because I think he has the traits to do it, but De La Salle just did not feature him enough for you to feel very good about what the projection was. So you have three players, one that I think impacts both at a very high level, but he has injury concerns. And then you have two players that impact one area well, but maybe they are a little bit of a question mark in the other. So I just don't see a complete all-around player right now. Could Old State develop into that? Sure. Could Cooper Flanagan develop into that? Absolutely. But then coming out of high school, I don't see anything right now to tangibly say they can be that all-around high-impact player in both areas. And then not even to mention, we didn't even talk about the fact that Kane Barron's not all, no longer on the roster, right? Kevin Bauman can't stay healthy. So now the depth is also getting a little thin on the roster as well. So that's going to affect the, you know, these guys are going to have to play football. You know, Holden States is going to have to play next year. Cooper Flanagan might have to play depending on what the depth chart looks like. And I think both could be really good players in their role. I'm just missing if I think that I, – I just don't – I'm not 100% certain right now – that either one of those players will ever be a high impact asset in both areas of the game. That's the sure. question mark for me right now. I think the guy that that brings the most potential there is Holden Stace, in my opinion, just because I actually think Holden Stace has a lot of potential as a blocker uh, in in a Tommy Tremble type of role. You know, like a guy that's pulling around and kicking out and doing not not so much as a driving off a nine technique in, in, on on duo or something like that. You know what I mean? Like it's more so really impactful in the zones, impactful in, on the perimeter, being a kickout guy in movement, but just lining up as a nine technique and blocking like Eli Redden does, he's he's a ways yeah. away from that. And I don't know if that's something I ever think that you should have recruited him to do. Uh, mm -hmm. I think Cooper Flanagan, I, I would consider, he he reminds me a lot of like a George Takis type and, and could be a really impactful guy that way. More of a, more Troy Nicholas than he is Tyler Eifert. If we're going to yes. use another name example, I think it's probably a better dichotomy to, to look at that. There's no doubt that Cooper Flanagan could, could could be at Notre Dame what Troy Nicholas was, which oh, is yeah. a really impactful pass catcher, but more in a 32 catch, 450 yard mm -hmm. type of thing. A Durham Smythe more than a a, a Cole Komet or right. a um, Michael Mayer, Tyler Eifert type with the high volume impact, move them out at, at – you know, the boundary and out and do all those kind of things. He's more of a traditional tight end, but in that role, he could be impactful. And Troy Nichols was a second round draft pick. He's a pretty good football player. It's just a different type of usage, in my opinion. Uh, and so I'm sure, um, you know, we're, we're on the same page there. Yep. Ryan, let's move on to the offensive line and we'll wrap up the offensive recruiting here. Okay. Let's get the positives. Let's discuss. We, we spent a lot of time in the previous show discussing the positives of the offensive line. And, and overall, it's an excellent group. We both went A-minuses. They signed a four-man haul last year. We are saying four because we are removing Joey Tanona from the conversation because he never even made it to spring ball because of their very unfortunate accident. 
he had pretty much soon after arriving in Notre Dame, which ended his football career. Mm-hmm. So he signed a four-man haul last year, talented group. He signed a, th- a five-man haul this year. To me, let's just quickly discuss what we like about it that earned the A- minus grade because an A-minus grade is still really good, and the reality is there's a lot of high ceilings in these last two years, a yes. lot of high ceilings. And we'll get into why it's the concerns we have here in a minute. But when you look at last year's class, Emil Wagner, Billy Shrouf, both five-star upside guys. Uh, Ty Chan, good football player, top 200 type of guy for me. Ashton Craig, very high upside guy. Lower floor, but very high upside. Then you look at this year's class. Charles Jagasaw, five-star now, five-star upside. I believe we both graded him out as a five-star after his senior yes. season, correct? Yep. Uh, yep. So that's a five-star kid. Uh, I know that Sullivan Absher, we have a little bit of difference of opinion on, but we both have a very high ceiling. Uh, yep. The thing that I like about this group is last year was a lot of low floor, high ceiling guys. This year, it's a lot of high floor guys and, mm-hmm. and at the bottom of the class. So like Sam Pendleton and Christopher Tarek and even Sullivan Absher to a degree – and Charles Jackson, they all have much higher floors than last year's group. The only guy with a lower floor in this year's group is Joe Otting because of mm-hmm. just the needing to build up his body. But you look at Notre Dame's signing day heights and weights, there's three guys already over 300 pounds in this class. It's in Jagasaw, Pendleton, and Absher, right? And yeah. it's not bad weight. You, you, I mean, you look at Sam Pendleton, he's just huge. Charles Jackson is just massive. I mean, he stood next to a, at, a, at a game this year. He was on a visit with Drake Bowen. Drake Bowen's six foot two, 230 pounds. And Charles Jagasaw made him look small. I mean, it was like, you got to be kidding me. My, I got shown that picture. I was like, good Lord. Like, I've seen Drake Bowen. I've been up close to Drake Bowen. He's a big kid. And Charles Jagasaw made him look tiny. And Sullivan Absher is massive. Sam Pendleton is massive. And Christopher Tarek, who is 6'5", 300 pounds, uh, is the fourth biggest guy in the class. Right? Slides. So they added a much – and that was the thing. They needed a big influx of size. Last year's group was, a, you know, Billy Shrouth was like 275 when he signed. Emil Wagner's like was like 250, 255, if we're being honest, when he signed. He was not 270. Uh, you, Ashton Craig was 270, 275. Uh, they, now, Billy Shrouth is over 300 now. They've put on weight, but you got to worry, like, are they going to have to put on too much weight? This group, however, is a lot like Ty Chan. They're just massive. They're just showing up at 300 pounds. Now it's just about body redistribution it, with this group. You know what I mean? And so – that was a big check for me. And this class also, this last two years also added a much needed jump in physicality. And I think that's why Tommy Reese getting Billy Shrouth late completely changed the outlook of last year's class. You know, because it was like Joey Tanone is kind of an athletic kid. You know, he had some toughness, but he's out. Neil Wagner's got a lot of tools, but he's undersized. Ty Chan's a pretty powerful kid. Ashton Craig get undersized they were battlers but they were going to need some they were going to need a lot of time before they can move people in college like they moved people in high school yep. this 23 class complements that really nicely because the athleticism of shrouth wagner and and craig is as good as you're going to find in a one two three combination of offensive linemen you're not going to find many linemen that are as athletic as that trio but they all need to gain a lot of weight and add strength and all that kind of stuff this group brings the mass they bring the power they bring the we're gonna beat you to death in this game. We're gonna we're gonna do to you what the 2017 offensive line did to USC. We're just gonna beat you in a submission. That's the potential that that group brings to the table. So, the, so I think these two groups complement each other, Ryan, really, really well. And this they also needed a big influx of interior talent, and this group did that as well. These two classes really boost the talent and depth along the interior of the offensive line, which is a big need in these two classes. Well, that's why I wanted to write that piece a few weeks ago, Brian, about the 2023 group just kind of being the exemplary example of what Harry Heastan wants of an offensive lineman, man. That is a mean, physical group that you have in 2023. I mean, if you watch the highlight tapes of Sam Pendleton, I mean, my guy is just – it's a pancake after pancake. Like, it, it, there's not a pancake NIL deal on the table for him down the line. They're – Sure this whole, this whole, t- dude. I said this on a tweet, Ryan. The whole twenty-three class should get some sort of IHOP deal. Sure. I'm serious. They're mean, man. It, They're I've mean. never seen a group of high school offensive linemen that had the pancake numbers that this group had. I'm being serious. I'm not even being hyperbolic. I've never seen a five-man class be this physically dominant at the high school level as this group was. 
And, and like you said, it's 300 across the board outside of Joe Otting, right? Like this, te- this group is, I mean, Sullivan Absher is a mean dude. Sam Pendleton is a mean dude. Christopher Tarek is a mean dude. Right. Charles Jagaso is an all state wrestler. <laughs> like right. it's just, it's, it's right. wild, man. Never and lost even, a high school wrestling match. Exactly. And, and even Joe Otting, that's only about 270 pounds. My guy needs to develop physically, but like he sure. gets after it in the At trenches. High school man. level. Absolutely. Yes. He does. So if he is able to put on a good amount of weight and sustain his strength profile, then man, he is going yeah. to be a, a good one too. So when you kind of put all those classes together, man, you're like, if Emil Wagner can gain weights and this group just develops the, on the on the path that I think it's already on, then you're talking about a insane combination of athleticism and power over the next few years. Yeah. My only thing that holds me back slightly. Sorry, did you want to add it first? Yeah, I just or, wanted to say yeah. something about that here real quick. When when you yeah, look at this group, I think the one thing about it too is, is I, I do think this is important. This group especially mm-hmm. fit a lot of the demeanor that Harry Heastan looks for. Harry Heastan looks for a unique type of kid. He wants the kids that are um, – like, it's not just about – like he wants smart kids. That's the thing is he doesn't just want these big physical – he wants really smart kids – and you guys saw it when we interviewed Sam Pendleton. Like that kid's gonna like run for office someday, or or be a CEO of some. I mean, that is a wicked smart kid that knows how to communicate and say things, right? That and then you know you meet Sullivan Absher, who's just as fun loving and goofy, and you know, but he's really smart, really smart. Yes. Charles Jagasaw is the same way. He's more of the quiet. Preserved. You know, sat yeah. yes, but but then you really smart. Joe Otting is just that really kind of sweet Midwestern, you know, Bible Belt kid that doesn't really talk a ton. He's always got that really big smile on his face. His mom's the one always on our show talking, not him. But then you see him. But here's the thing. And, and we don't know Christopher Tarek as well. So we're, I'm not going to comment on him because we just don't know him as well. But he's another guy that's just kind of quiet and reserved from what we have been able to tell. But when you put them all together, Ryan, they all have the phys- the same on field. Their demeanor is identical. They're all smart. And they all have the same – even Joe Wadding, who's an undersized kid, he plays the game the same way Sam Pendleton does, mean and physical. And that's what makes this such a very Harry Heastan-esque offensive line. There's no question. Now, he had help. Chad Bowden helps and Tommy Reese helps, and that's how it should be. But there's no doubt that the guys they identified were have Harry Heastan's blueprints all over them, 100%. all over them. When you look at those factors, Ryan, I just wanted yep. to hit on that before we jumped into the the, the legitimate concern that we that we do have in yeah. this group. Yeah, and I, I mean, this is literally the only concern I have, and this is why it made it go to an A minus rather than an A, because I think that when you look at just every player in a vacuum together, you're like, you got good numbers the last two years, yeah. even with the unfortunate, you know, medical retirement of jo- of um, Joey of uh, Joey Tonona, but you still have. Some fantastic players, a lot of size, athleticism. There's there's a lot of great things to work look at it. But the last two classes, though, right? It's gonna put some. It's gonna put a little bit of an emphasis on offensive tackle Let types. Let me ask you this: Did you say yes. if you just look at the players individually and just from a talent standpoint, it's an A? It's an A. Yeah, okay, I, I thought I heard you backwards. Okay, we agree. Yep. I just want to make sure yep. I I didn't hear you. Correctly on that one. So if you just look at them with a blank with a blank name and just yep. put their num- their number in a hat and you're just like Agreed. that all together, that's an Agreed. A, right? Agreed. Like that is just it. Agreed. But the the part that holds me back slightly is that your true offensive tackles that you know are definitely gonna be offensive tackles down the line, your Charles Jagasaws, Emil Wagner's, Sullivan Absher's. I still think there's a possibility that Absher might be a guard long term, which or is fine guard. because yeah, right. because I think he'll be a really darn good guard. Like I think he'll be dominant potentially in there. But the problem that comes with that is that you're putting a lot of eggs into the basket, if that is the case, of Emil Wagner being your offensive tackle moving forward. And if he can't be, it's fine. But that does put a lot of pressure on the 2024 class to get your true offensive tackle types of the right. future. Because if if Sullivan Absher is not an offensive tackle and Emil Wagner can't gain the weight appropriate, then Charles Jagasso is the only one that I feel positive about being an offensive tackle at the next level and being a good one at that. So you're, you're looking at that and I'm just like, 
you got a lot of great offensive linemen, but you got a lot more interior types, in my opinion, than you got offensive tackle types. And for the sake of balance, I think that that's the only part that just gives me pause for a second. Now, if you go into 2024 and you get Gerby Lambert and, uh, you know, you have Peter Jones already, who's more of an interior lineman, but if you get a Gerby Lambert and another true offensive tackle type, then you're fine. Long and we're time. having a different conversation next year. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I, I think if Emil Wagner wasn't, if Emil Wagner didn't also have the size question for me, mm-hmm. I would feel a lot better about it because here, exactly. here's the way I look at it. This group went up in grade for me when we watched Charles Jagasaw senior film, because Charles Jagasaw can play left tackle. There's oh, yes. no doubt. It's just, it's the same thing. It's the same argument I made for Blake Fisher. Can Blake Fisher be a left tackle? Yeah. Remember people are saying, no, Blake should be at left and put Joe on right. And it's like, no, we know Joe Walt's an elite left tackle, right? And and yes, I think Blake Fisher could be a very good left tackle, but he could be a star right tackle for what I view a right tackle to be. And mm-hmm. and so when I look at Charles Jackson, there's not a doubt in my mind he can be a very, very good left tackle. But I think he could be a star as a right tackle sure. and potentially as a guard. You know, he could be a, a, a truly special guard if that's what gets him on the field the fastest. And then you kick him back out to tackle when that time comes, if, if that's what works best for you same with Sullivan Absher I think Sullivan Absher can be a a tackle in college Uh, there's questions I have as I've said about pass blocking but athletically and length and all that he could be a tackle but sometimes I wonder but he's a right tackle if he is a tackle but then you say but maybe guard is where he is best and that's the concern and so when I look at it and then Chris Tarek's a pure inside guy so when I look at it Ryan I'm with you if the, the, I, who's the left tackle if Emil Wagner can't add the weight? That's my question. So you, you put Jagas all there. Okay, cool. But he could be very good there. But is are you really using him at his best position? Right. You know, like that's kind of how I felt about Mike McGlinchey in 16 and 17. I thought he was really good in both years. He was a third team All American in 2016. He was a first team All American in 2017. And it was an earned reward. But I always felt that Mike McGlinchey would have been best. His best season, in my view, was 2015 when he was a right tackle because the, the pass blocking responsibilities are a little bit different mm-hmm. at playing right tackle. I thought that was his best year. He was special in 2015 yeah. because I think that was a more fitting position for him. So still very, I mean, all American left tackle come becomes a top 10 pick, but where did they draft him in the top 10 to play right tackle? Yep. Right. So that's kind of the thing for me is, is that that is why I, the overall grade is an A minus is that question right there. Yep. If Emil Wagner hits and he can add the necessary weight and get up to at least 290 and be a legit left tackle, this grade jumps up a bunch. He's the key for me. Mm-hmm. He's the key for me. If Emil Wagner hits, because I graded him as a top 250 caliber player coming out with a five-star upside. It's not often a guy gets a five-star upside when he's a top 250 grade. Most of the guys with five-star upside are like the top 100 type of guys. But he has it because you have to bring him down because of the size. He is incredibly long. He's got very powerful hands. He's athletic. From everything I've been told, he's very smart. And, mm-hmm. and so you, you, you see all the traits, but I don't care how strong you are. If you're 270 and you're going up against an elite defensive lineman like the Cats that Alabama just signed, like James Smith and all those guys that are like 300 now, you're going to get tossed around. Mm-hmm. You, you just are. And so the question is, is can he get up to 290 plus and maintain that athleticism and that quickness and all those other things, That's the which would make him a left tackle? That's the concern. That's the big red flag. That's the one thing that brings down A-. minus. If, if Emil Wagner was, was a 280, 285-pound kid when they signed him, legit, it, A grade. It's an A grade. Because he's your left tackle. But because he's a question mark, just because of size, it's it's really the only concern we have about Emil Wagner. That is it. But it's a pretty big freaking concern. Look, I've seen clips of Emil from bowl prep, and he's still skinny. He just is. He's still really skinny. So we're going to find out over the next year how much he can get to. But if he can, if he can hit Ryan, he mm-hmm. is the key to this yes. offensive class. He's the key. I agree. Let's switch over to defense, Ryan. Just overall, talk to me about what your grade is for the Notre Dame defense 
and you look at the two year grade together and what you like about this group. Yeah. I mean, I, I gave it an A minus as a whole from the defensive perspective. And I think that when you look at it from a 2023 perspective, there's going to be a conversation that needs to happen about the defensive line specifically and the safeties as far as, because I, I feel like we may have a slight difference of opinion on the safeties, but we'll get to there obviously. But like for the defensive line, for, for, uh, for example, a lot of high ceilings, but there's some floors that kind of make you worry a little bit, right? But I think for me, man, the linebackers over the last two years, it's hard to find a better two-year haul in the entire country, right? They've gotten longer, more athletic on the second level. Cornerback recruiting has been fantastic, and but there's been some questions as far as from a safety group, as far as the depth that you've gotten the last two classes, specifically about what you did in the 2022 recruiting class and then the defensive line I feel like you've gotten a lot of really talented power based players up front and you're starting to get longer you're starting to get bigger but I think you are still missing on those true viper types over the last two years which I think it makes it a little bit of an incomplete class so the positives by far is that all three levels even with shortcomings that we'll talk about at a couple different positions defensively you have gotten longer and you've gotten more athletic on all three levels. Those things are absolutely there. But there are some things from floor perspectives and numbers perspectives that gives me pause because the margin for error is a little bit smaller and it's going to put a big onus on the development and coaching side of the conversation. And there's going to be a lot of players that are going to be massive rewards or potential failures, right, as far as their development is concerned. So I think that there's some question marks, Brian, for me from a depth at a, cur- a couple spots and from a floor perspective. But I, think, I don't think there's any doubt that it's still an excellent two-year hole, in my opinion, because the main thing that Marcus Freeman wanted to get done when he became the defensive coordinator of Notre Dame and now transitioned to head coach is he wanted to get longer, more athletic, and explosive on all three levels – and I don't think there's any question that when you look compare the 2022 and 2023 classes together, teams are going to start looking at Notre Dame and be like, man, they're all just long athletic dudes. Like, where are these right. guys coming from? And I think right. that that was a thing that was needed at Notre Dame. And I think it's a thing that has gotten accomplished over the last two years. Ryan, I, I agree with almost everything you said. I actually, I agree mm-hmm. with everything you said. Here's the thing. The concerns yep. you have, are mm-hmm. the same ones I have. I just think they're more impactful, which is why I go down to a B plus. So keep in mind, B plus means you're a top 10 to 15 group. And I think this group is closer to the 10 side. I think the things that you hit on that to me that are absolutely on point are the fact that this is a group that to me is it's. You have too many projects at a very key position, which is the defensive line. It, now, kids whose talent I love, but projects. And and that's something that just brings this grade down a little bit for me, is that right there. Uh, I just, it's such an important position that I can't give them an A- minus when I look around the country and I'm watching other teams that are competing for championships, signing guys like Ohio State's, you know, numbers-wise, but they're getting the Jason Moores and some of those guys that are, that are more ready to make ready made guys. Georgia's doing that. Um, Alabama's doing that. I think that projectableness at that position, combined with the complete disaster that was safety recruiting in 2022, that is what brings it down for me. But it's still a top 10 class. But top 10 doesn't get you an A or an A minus for me. It's right mm-hmm. on the cusp. So we are very, very close. And our concern yeah. is the same exact concern. It's mm-hmm. kind of like earlier, Ryan, when we were looking at quarterback, we yeah. had the same concern. Uh, running back, we had the same concern. It, for you, just caused you to bring the grade down a little bit more than I brought it down. That's how I feel about the defense overall. We have the same view of it. It's just, to me, it's more impactful because it's the defensive line. And and if it was linebacker, it'd be a different story because if you had an A defensive line and then like a, a B linebacker group that's got some low floors but really high ceilings 
I'm good because the great defensive line can make up for that and it makes that group better. There is no safe protecting a defensive line that doesn't pan out. Right. You, you just there's no there's no hiding that. You can hide safeties. Mm-hmm. You can hide linebackers. You can even to a degree hide some corners. You can't hide a defensive line that's not good enough. You um, can. But the talent of this group is really impressive over two years. And so people know we are looking at the kids. The one thing we do when we look at the roster and as far as we say, hey, we're not going to impact where guys are from a standpoint of how they played. We are, however, looking at it from where they're playing mm-hmm. and the position they're playing, in my opinion, now. So like Josh Burnham, we're counting as a as a defensive lineman. I left yep. Junior Chi Alamaka at linebacker because he's saying he looks like Viper, but there's still some uncertainty from what I understand. So for now, we'll look at him at linebacker, but he could be thrown into the defensive line mix as well. But Josh mm-hmm. Burnham, we're counting as a Viper in this class. So he, when we talk right. about the defensive line, he'll be part of that. Uh, and, and we would have we counted Jaden Bellamy as a safety, even though last year he was considered a corner, just so people kind of understand what we're looking at on that. Yeah. Let's move to the defensive line, Ryan, and just kind of mm-hmm. talk about this group because this is really, this is really a group that uh, for me was hard to grade. I went B plus. And the reason I went B plus is, and and I think that this is a group where I think fans in the chat could argue with us on this and say it should even be a lower grade because Mm -hmm. there is so much projectability here. But the thing about it is there is so much talent in this group. I mean, you look at last year, Josh Burnham's a five-star upside, even as a defensive end. I mean, we wrote about the fact he may outgrow linebacker last year. You know, you, you look at that. He's long, he's athletic, he's twitchy. He's an incredibly, incredibly talented player. Tyson Ford, a raw kid, but incredibly talented. Uh, same thing with um, Aiden Gobira, very raw player, needs to build up his body, but a very high ceiling kid. And then you have Donovan Heinish, who is not the physical presence that these other guys have, uh, you know, and he's a guy that brings a great motor, great athleticism. I'm looking at my 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 grade for my film analysis from Josh Burnham last year when Notre Dame signed him. This is my first paragraph of the film analysis. So the first thing that jumps out about Burnham is frame and length. Listed at 6'4", 215 pounds, Burnham possesses an excellent frame that will allow him to fill out quite a bit. Right now I project Burnham as an inside linebacker, and while I don't see it happening, it happened quickly, it wouldn't shock me if he outgrew linebacker ended up coming off the edge. Well, it happened a lot faster than than I thought. You know what I mean? Uh, and and because the tools are there. And so when I v- valued him as a top 100 guy, part of that was the fact that this kid could easily move to the edge and play there. He's a top 100 guy. Tyson Ford was a top 100 guy. Aiden Gobira had top 100 upside. Uh, you're looking at this year's class. Bubakar Traore might have a higher ceiling than anybody that they've signed in the last two classes. Uh, mm-hmm. Devin Houston's a kid that I love. He's probably has the highest floor of everybody they've signed the last two years. Uh, it's ironic, but I think the two highest floors might be him and Donovan Heinish. I mean, it's just floors, right? Yeah. Um, and then, of course, you have Armel Mookum. So the, the issue with this class is this: there's just so many – there's just so many – floor issues. Brennan Vernon's another one. I think you nailed this on signing or was it yesterday or signing day when you said, I think there's Brennan Vernon is one of the kids where there's the biggest misconception that anybody that, of anybody in this class, because there's yeah. this perception because he looks like he's 30 years old. I mean, Brennan <laughs> Vernon looks like he's an eight year NFL vet physically, he does. you know, and when he shaved his hair, he looked even older. When he grows his beard out and shaved his head, he looked like a 30 year old. Like you're like, Hey, is who interviewed? Whose dad is that? You know what I mean? Like, is that a dad of one of the kids that signed or something like that? He looks like a grown man, but his yes. game is and his body still very raw, which is mm-hmm. exciting. It's a good thing, but it also means he's not a plug and play guy right away necessarily. Now, he may get there by the time the season starts, but on signing day, he's not there yet. And I think that's the thing for me, Ryan. Is if I'm just going talent, this is an A group. I mean, it is a high A group. I mean, yeah. there is Burnham. Uh, I, I, let me let me just check this just to be sure, Ryan, because I I, I want to make sure that I'm not saying something that's that's inaccurate here. But I'm pretty sure that three of the four defensive linemen from last year's class I gave five star upside grades to. So I gave Burnham a five star upside grade, I gave Tyson four to five star upside grade, and I gave Aiden Byron. Yes, I gave all three of those guys five star upside grades. And then 
I gave uh, two five star upside grades in this year's class: Traore and uh, Brendan Vernon. Devin mm-hmm. Houston and Armo Mukum are both four and a half star upside grades. I love their upside. That's five five star upside defensive linemen in two years. That's yep. outstanding. The problem, however, is there's a ways to go for all of them between where they are now and that five star upside, and that's what dragged the grade down to a B plus for me. Yeah, and I, I feel like another thing too, Brian, is that there's not so. I feel like Notre Dame got a lot of the same type of player over the last two classes. You Especially know, there's a year. lot. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of big ends in this class that could potentially be three techniques. Like I think that there is a legitimate world where Brendan Vernon is a three technique down the line if he doesn't, you know, because I think he could outgrow or it knows. very early. Yeah, or, or knows. knows. Yeah. So I mean, I, I think you look at him, Devin Houston, or power base players where Devin Houston is most certainly going to end up inside. But even when you combine guys like Tyson Ford is a similar conversation. Armel Mukum's a similar conversation. Pupacar Triori, because they're right now, they're more big ends than anything right now. And a couple of those guys obviously will move inside eventually. But the problem I come back to is that Joshua Burnham might save the Viper position from a depth perspective. Because, I mean, you were potentially sitting at – if Aiden Gabira isn't the, a you know a big time producer at Viper down the line, then you really need to figure something out in 2024, which you still do need to do that because it's still you still need to kind of continue to stock that position. But there's just so many question marks for me that really tampers down my expectations for what I. I mean, again, I, I think that this is a really exciting combination of players when you're talking about the talent they have. I mean, there are several. 80 inch wingspans in this conversation, right? There's several big time strong side defensive ends, big ends in this conversation. There are several guys that could be potential dominant players as penetration styles, interior defensive line. There is, but there's not really a lot of high floors to your points, right? Like you mentioned, Devin Houston has a decent floor in this two year haul. Donovan Heinish might have a decent floor because he maybe just doesn't have quite the ceiling of the other guys. But there's a, I mean, you need to hit on a couple of these really toolsy defensive ends. That body may still be growing and floors are not potentially as high as you would like, right? Like there is a, Mm -hmm. there's a reality where Brandon Vernon, Bubakor Traore, Armel Mukum, all are solid players, but never reach their ceiling, right? Like that, that, that is, that's a possible thing. But the other possibility is that they all hit their ceiling and then you're like, that's an embarrassment of riches. Right. But there's just so much variance right now in this class right. between the ceilings and the floor that I look at and say, I'm a little nervous, right? Yeah. If you don't have great coaching and great development, then this could be a problem. And then it's go. also a problem because you don't have a ton of true Viper types in this class. You have a lot of the or last two cycles. You have a lot of the same type of guy. So unless Burnham and Gobira become a star-studded pairing or at least a very good pairing, then you're left 2024. You got to get a couple vipers, man. Right. You got it. You got to figure it out, or else you just are kind of doomed with the same type of profile for a lot of different guys. I feel like moving Josh Burnham was because of Josh Burnham. Like he yes. just got so big so fast and like good mm-hmm. big. Like you and I saw him. He is not putting on bad weight at all. He's just <laughs> filling out really fast. Yes, but I feel like moving Junior to Alamaka was more of, of a reaction to your issues at that position than mm-hmm. a G. His skill set fits that position great. That yeah. to me is a bit of a panic move, a little bit more so mm-hmm. than anything else. And that's not where you want to be. You want to move a guy because, dude, I think this guy could be a dude there, not because crap we're running low on numbers and and you know and, and low floors and not enough high ceilings. Now you're hurting your so you're robbing Peter to pay Paul, so to speak, right? The old as the old expression goes, and that's my concern there. Here, here's the other thing. Two things I want to talk about. One is a concern. One is a we'll see because this could change the grade. My here's the big elephant in the room for me. If Mike Elson was still the defensive line coach, I'd my grade would be different. Flat out, it would. Because I know that Mike Elson is going to get them at least to a certain level. Al Washington did not show me that this year at all. Now, it's just one year, right? And I want to give a guy a chance because what we, what do we say about other coaches? Like, let them get to year two when they know the kids better and they know the, they know what gets to kids and how to impact kids. It takes some time to learn how to reach every single kid in your room, especially a position like defensive line where there's a lot of kids in the room. 
Dino McCall had five kids to worry about. Tom Reese had four or five kids to worry about. That's a whole lot different than when you've got 18 or 15, 16 yeah. guys. And so I want to give Coach Washington another year to show me something, but I also have to be honest and objective to say I was not impressed by the job he did. You saw too many guys regress this year and yeah. not enough guys make jumps this year for me. To, like even, though, even Gabriel Rubio started playing more and playing better, but he wasn't as good as I think he should be by year two. Just isn't. Mm -hmm. And so that's a concern for me. And if I felt better about the development at Notre Dame, my opinion would change about this. Cause like I look at guys like, like there's a lot of these type of guys on the offensive line, but why are we not concerned about them? Cause we know that Harry Heaston is going to get these kids coached up and ready to play. He has a proven track record of doing that. Al Washington doesn't. And that's a concern for me a little bit. Right. So that's, that's my concern, right? And I'm, I'm quickly curious. I mean, do you have any, difference of opinion on that i mean is that a concern that you share as well did that factor yeah. into your thought process here as well i i said that in the article that came out today brian about the defensive line for 2023 potentially being the make it or break it for this class because i think that when you look at it it's a coach's dream in the sense that there's all the talent in the world to work oh, yeah. with but it's also a program's nightmare in the sense that if your development and coaching is not up to par at a position then you're in trouble. Then you're absolutely in trouble because the floors are just not there, right? Like it, if Keon Keeley was in the class, for instance, for Notre Dame in 2023, right? It's like, okay, a couple of those guys don't pan out. It stinks, not as good as it could have been, but you still got Keon Keeley. Sure. Or even if you had a Jason Moore. Exactly. You know, he's, he's similar in style to those other guys, but he's a dude that you're like, that guy's going to walk on campus and you can't screw him up. Like no. You, no. there's no way to screw that kid up as a coach. No. Like you just – He's just going to be a dude because he's there yet. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. These other kids are not that. Here's the other question yes. I have for you, Ryan. Yeah, because we gotta we gotta try to get through these last couple positions because I know you're on a bit of a time crunch here. Uh, here's the other thought though. Yep. Marcus Freeman was a big believer in the three three five. Yes, and there are versions of that I like and versions I don't. Just like there's versions of the four two five I like and some I don't. Here's the thing. If you were to tell me that Notre Dame was going to switch to a 3-3-5, then what I would say is they recruit – then I'll be honest, my grade goes up because they recruited a bunch of three-down linemen. They recruited a lot Thanks. of those. See, so like now, Brennan Vernon and, and Armel Mookum and um, – like if they're all big ends, then basically Tyson Ford, Brennan Vernon um, – Armo Mukum and Brubakar Trey are all the same dude. They play mm -hmm. one position. Maybe right. a couple of them grow into three techniques. But if you're in a 3-3-5, three, three, they play two positions. Uh -huh. And you're now balancing these kids at two positions. Where now Armo Mukum, or excuse me, Bubakar and Brendan Vernon aren't and Tyson Ford aren't competing for one position. They're competing for two. And then now Josh Burnham becomes that hybrid piece that, and I'll give the staff credit. Marcus Freeman, I think, wants to be there, but Foskey's not that dude. Foskey can drop into coverage as a zone-dropping defensive end. We saw him do that this year. He's not a guy you want off the ball playing around. That's just – he's just – that's – they tried doing that last year. It didn't work. That's not who he is. He can zone-drop as a outside linebacker-ish defensive end, and he – I mean, we saw that against Syracuse when he, like, twice ran on wheel routes back-to-back -back against Sean Tucker and was like, dude, you're not outrunning me. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I hate to break a team, but you're not outrunning me, cuz. So, like, to me, that's impactful that they they do have – now, I don't know if this is intentional or just kind of mm -hmm. how it went, mm -hmm. but even Keon, when it's all said and done, could be a elite rushing three, th three, three guy, in my opinion, in, in two different roles. He could play some three. He can play some of that, that, that edge group, but this group incredibly fits that well, because then you could have Josh Burnham be sort of one of the three linebackers. And then he can line up on the edge on one snap and be a, you know, a, a, a Darian Beaver on another snap. Right. I mean, he's a, he's a Sam linebacker at that yes, point. Right. Right. Who yeah. can also line up and come off the edge. Like, so to me, yeah. if I knew that that's what they wanted to transition to my grade goes up for the defensive line, it's because I think a lot of these kids fit that defense really well, where some of these guys, you got to pump up a little bit to get them to three techniques. You got to add mm -hmm. some weight to Tyson Ford to get him to three technique. You got to add some weight to Armel Mookum and Buba Karcher to get him to three technique. You don't have to add as much to have them be five techniques 
agree or disagree. And it agree. also adds more versatility to Devin Houston and Brendan Vernon because they can be a nose, they can be a five technique, they can be strong side, weak side, all that kind of stuff. That now would say last year you didn't have the personnel to run that defense. This year and moving forward with this group, with Riley Mills, with Nana, even in 2023, your mm-hmm. roster looks a lot more with Jordan, but with your Viper now being Batelho and Burnham and and um, uh, Byron J- uh, J- to Alamaca because okay. J- J- Gabiro would probably stay as more of an edge guy. But with those mm-hmm. three guys as sort of your your Viper, even Justin Adamiola, who's lined up at Mike at times, those kids mm-hmm. all now fit more of a three three Darren Beavers role more so than a pure Isaiah Foskey role. So now your personnel looks a little bit different where it could fit what Marcus Freeman ultimately wanted to do. That's something I've been thinking a lot about lately, Ryan. And somebody in the chat brought that up. Berkshire Yank brought that up. And, and I wrote about this in the article we did about um, that you and I wrote together about Braden Fisk mm-hmm. and why he'd be such an impact transfer because he can play three technique on one snap. And then on the very next snap, go out and play five technique. And then you don't – because here's the thing about it. If you got Burnham as your Viper in a 3-3-5, mm-hmm. you can go from 4-2-5 to 3-3 three, three in a second without change of personnel. Sure. That's hard to do. Yeah. And to me, that – like, Beavers couldn't do that. Beavers could be a really good Sam, but he wasn't the guy that, to me, you put on the edge and rush the quarterback. They had to substitute to get to a four-down look. They'd bring in that other kid. I'm trying to remember his name of that other defensive edge player that Cincinnati would bring in that year. Uh, and I can't remember his name. I'm, I'm going to look it up now because it's going to bother me. But Cincinnati had to substitute to get into that look. Like when they played Georgia, for example, in the bowl game, Ryan, mm-hmm. they had to they they literally had to change personnel to to be able to play there. If Josh Burnham is your Viper, you don't have to do that. You can just play more four down, yep. and you're good to go. And I think that's the that's the kind that's the aspect of this that I that I really like. Ethan Tucky, that's who it was. Tucky. Um, yeah. No, uh, that's what I like about what this group could be if they are. But see, again, I don't I don't know that they're doing that. So I can't affect I can't have the grade reflect that I have to reflect what we know that they've run. So thoughts on that, Ryan? It, it would make a lot more sense if that's what they were doing. Right. When you think about it, because I mean, no, Notre Dame literally just took three players in 2023 that are the same type of player from a. You know, they're big ends. They're strong side defensive ends. They're guys that, you know, are power-based rushers. So if they are trying to load up on length, which, I mean, Brian, if we're talking about one thing that they did in 2024, I mean, 2023, excuse me, they got a lot of length, man. I mean, who's the who's the guy with the least amount of length? Devin Houston? Like, right. <laughs> it's insane, man. And what do you need when you play a three-man That is kind of nuts. <laughs> it's nuts, man. It's absolutely nuts. I mean, then you, ter- you combine that with, getting guys like Gobira and Joshua Burnham and Tyson Ford last year, like that is some crazy length that you've gotten over the last few years. But the reason I say that is because in order to place a lot of three man, three man, you got, you can have guys that have some different body types at times, but the thing that is pretty consistent across the board, you usually have a lot of length. Usually that's a, a consistent thing. So being able to get that type of length, it could be setting up for that. I mean, I wouldn't put it out of, out of the realm of possibility. And it makes a lot of sense that why a guy like a Joshua Burnham, who is a linebacker by trade, sort of, but has now kind of outgrown the position to be a little bit more of an on-ball guy, but still has the athletic traits to work in space a little bit to be a hybrid type player, would fit perfectly into that 3-3 alignments where you could quickly substitute and get him up on the line of scrimmage and become a 4-2-5 adjustment. So I don't know if that's what they're doing, to your point. Mm-hmm. But if it is what they're doing, I kind of like it. Yes. I do. I, I do kind of like it. Like if that's their master yes. plan, I'm like, yes. all right, I can get there. Yeah, I can get there with that because they have the body types moving forward because Notre Dame hasn't had that over the last right. few years. They haven't. They haven't had that type of length up front where they could legitimately play a three-man – I mean, like, that's what they were doing. I mean, I know they were more of a 3-4 alignment in the early two, 2010s when they had, like, Stefan Tewitt and those guys. But they really haven't played, you know, a ton of three-down in recent years. They've been more, right. much more of a four-down team. They tried they've it had, in 2021, and it just didn't work because Foskey right. just wasn't – Foskey so, wasn't a, so a three-down lineman, and he wasn't a yes. three-down linebacker. He's a four, and so he's wisely, a four, late in the, in the year, they yeah. used him a lot more as a pure end, and this year they did that. That's called coaching to your talent. That is an area yes. where they've done well with that. 
Mm-hmm. That isn't really done well with that. But and that that is and I, I would give kind of a, a slow clap and a nice little golf clap to Marcus Freeman in that realm, to your point, Brian, because don't force your best assets right. into do it into a defense that doesn't make sense for them, right? Make right. sure you I was like people always ask defensive coordinators this and Defensive coordinators lie to a degree. They'll always ask them, like, what do you want to do defensively? And, and you know, the cliche answer is whatever my, best fits my players. Bull crap. And No yes. coach truly believes that. Every coach <laughs> exactly. has something he'd like to do. 100%. Now, the great coaches will be open to that, but you got to yep. recruit to something. Yes. There is a base defense that every defensive mind loves, right? If you're There's saying that, that in year one. five, Ryan, you need to find a new job. Exactly. You, you know what I mean? Exactly. Like, no, that's yep. what you say in year one and two when you take over your system. Like, Mark, then you recruit to what you want to do. Yes. And and that's, you don't have the yeah. you don't have the guys to play the defense that you want to play. But how you fix that is now you recruit to get to that point, right? A little bit of foresight into making that switch. So if that is where they're heading, I applaud them because I think it yeah. makes sense. And the guys that they're bringing in certainly fit the profile. Ryan, we're going to quickly, because because you've got to get out of here somewhat soon, so we're going to quickly move on to linebacker, then safety, and then we'll do corner and, and message board in the Super Chats afterwards, because I can handle corner if you have to bail, and I want to give you a chance to talk about safety. Yes. Let's dive into linebacker really quick, though, because this is one of the easiest sells. This is an outstanding yes. group of linebackers, yes. and there's easy ones, right? There's Jalen Sneed, mm-hmm. star potential. Yep. Tons of star potential. Now, we said last year that it may take him a little bit of time because he's kind of raw, learning a new position. So I'm not shocked he didn't make an immediate impact at all. It hasn't phased me one bit. Yep. Because when he did get on the field, you saw, oh, yeah, that's why he was <laughs> my number one defensive player in the class. Uh, but he wasn't the hands-down number one player because of how good the Burnhams and guys like that and Benjamin Morrison were. But what it, we we know Drake Bowen gets all the hype and deservedly so because he was a dude this year. All the hype from Notre Dame fans. Rival still has him as a top fifty recruit. Anyone that doesn't have him in the top fifty to me is just whatever. I don't have any. I, if you're if you don't have him as a surefire top hundred player, then you just don't know what you're looking at, right? He's a guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's the other guys that make this group for me. And 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 an A A for me, A for you. We both had A, yes. right? Yep. Yep. It's yes, sneak. You've got to get to have an A. You need the elite guys and and Jalen Sneed is that and and Drake Bowen is that but there's two other guys to me one in this year's class one in last year's class that are really what solidify it for me and this year it's Jaden Osbury Mm -hmm. who I think is a is an absolute stud Mm -hmm. and then last year's class Nolan Ziegler he is one he is arguably the most underrated player in the last two years for me as far as how he's perceived by Notre Dame fans Benjamin Morrison was clearly the most underrated player overall, right? But I, I think a lot of note. I think I had a lot of people in this chat convinced last year that Benjamin Morrison was going to be a dude, because when he did break out, that's the first thing that people would say is like, "Oh, Driscoll called that one." Like I think we had him convinced of that. Mm-hmm. I think Nolan Ziegler is going to shock people. I think he is going to be a dude at linebacker, right? And you and I have seen some things that, like, okay, yep. <laughs> but even coming out of high school. I mean, we talked about this. They, he played against a junior version of Drake Bowen on, a, against each other in high school, and Nolan Ziegler was the best kid on the field that day, mm-hmm. by far. You know, now Drake had a huge jump as a senior, just like Nolan had a huge jump as a senior. But he was a he was a top one hundred and fifty, borderline top hundred recruit for me, Ryan. And then, of course, Jaden Osbury is flat out a top hundred, borderline top fifty recruit for me. That's four legitimate impact players that aren't just good players, but you're going to have a dude on the bench right. at linebacker. And we're not even getting into Preston Zinter, where in past years, there's a lot of years in Jalen Smith's class, Preston Zinter is the number two linebacker in that class behind Jalen Smith, flat mm-hmm. out. Then there's a lot of years where that's true, right? But now nobody talks about him because you're like Drake Bowen, Jaden Osbury, Jalen Sneed, Josh Burnham, Nolan Ziegler, you know what I mean? To where you could lose Josh Burnham from linebacker and still be an A. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's how good linebacker recruiting has been the last two years. Uh, I mean, and it's it's one where we don't even have to spend too much time on it, right? Because it's like everybody knows, dude, dude, dude. <laughs> that's another dude. There's another dude over there in the weight room is another dude. The guy out yep. back is a dude. Like it's just it's an embarrassment of riches, man. To so much to the degree, Brian, where 
Notre Dame, if they develop them properly, is going to be in a situation soon where they're like, man, how do I get that kid on the field? Because he's just too good to keep off. But it's just I just can't find a spot, you know, because it's just – look, Drake Bowen is a stud. Buckus Award winner, Mr. Football in the state of Indiana. Jay Nosbury is a dude, the all-time leading tackler at University Lab that puts out a silly amount of talents to combine with Nolan Ziegler, who moves as well as any linebacker you have from a length and explosiveness perspective outside of Jalen Sneed, who is an absolute freak show at linebacker. Preston Zinter Jr. Tuella Makamura, the true Mike types that are just physical, good football players. This is a versatile group. There's a lot of different body types, and you can do a lot of different things. Like it doesn't matter if you're a three-three team, a four-two team, a four-three team. It does a four-four team. It doesn't matter. You have a linebacker group in the last two years where you look at it and say, "Oh, I need a guy to play this specific role. I got him. I probably got two. I need him to play this other kind of role. I got one, probably two. You have mm-hmm. created depth, and you've also gotten high-level talent in the last two years. So there's really and the athleticism hit, is insane in this. The team. athleticism is insane. You have the numbers and you have the overall variance of traits where all of them could fit so well together as well. Like right. you haven't overloaded on just true mics or just true wills. You've gotten the rover types, you've gotten the will types, you've gotten the mic types, you've even gotten guys that can play on ball a little bit for what you need. Right. So you've got some guys that play out in space board. at Rover. Yep. Let, let me say this too. You talk about we like football players. Josh Burnham, who's a Viper, you know, played linebacker, was a thousand yard passer and a thousand yard rusher in high school. Jalen Sneed, as a senior, moved to quarterback and rushed for 815 yards and 11 touchdowns. Nolan Ziegler had over a thousand yards receiving as a senior in high school. Uh, Drake Bowen was missing Mr. Indiana in football, not just because he was a 144 tackles and 18, it was like 20 tackles for loss or something insane like that. Cause he also rushed for over 1700 yards and 26 touchdowns and um, Preston's uh, Preston's enter mm-hmm. also a really good, if, if we, if there's a need at tight end and there was an injury and they said, Hey, we're moving Preston's enter. I'm like, yeah, okay. Word. Let's roll. <laughs> we put him in like a fullback H back role. Yes. Let's do it. That kid can play there for Notre Dame, right? Mm-hmm. And then Jay Nalsbury also is a guy that would that would play played offense and had I think about like it's I think like eight to ten rushing touchdowns this year for mm-hmm. for University Lab. So these aren't kids that just you line up and plug up. The only guy that was like that, that wasn't like that was Junior Two Alamaka, who's a traditional linebacker. But all these kids are rangy athletic football players, not just you know thumper middle linebackers. I love absolutely love this group. It, I've it's been a long time. Since Notre Dame's had back-to-back classes like this at linebacker a very long time, very long time, to the point where you can take Josh Burnham out of it and not miss a beat. <laughs> I mean, know? you've gotten so much depth, Brian, where, like, if God forbid something happened to one of the players where, like, they had to medically retire or something unforeseen like that, you're still like – Or even just missed a couple year, a couple games right. because of an injury, right? You're, but you're like, the depth is just so strong where you can recover from even an unforeseen consequence, which is where you want to be as a roster, man. Like, because right. stuff is going to happen. You know, there's going to be unforeseen injuries and, you know, things that happen off the field. And right. there's always going to be some type of thing that's you're, it's going to be unforeseen. But the fact that you can recover so well at that position – is a testament to how high level of recruiters they've been over the last two years at the linebacker spot. Ryan, let's go to safety, and and yeah. we're gonna we're gonna go to it. I went B minus, and I'll explain mm-hmm. why. But I want to give you first crack because I know we're getting kind of close to the time where you have to you have a little family party you got to get to. Yep. Uh, you gave B plus. I did. Tell me why, because yeah. that's the one that's the one grade that you and I had a every other one's like A to A minus B plus to mm-hmm. A minus B plus to B. This is the one where you and I had a pretty big because I was actually on the verge of going C plus more so than going up to a B. So explain mm-hmm. to me why it's a C plus uh, for you. I, I think it's because there is I, I still am really high on what they did in 2023. Mm-hmm. Right. And. I understand that there's going to be some people that are going to shake their heads. For, for those and, wondering, we are counting Brandon Hillman. Sorry, Ryan. Yes. So make sure people, yep. we are counting Brandon Hillman in the safety group. When when Ryan talks about yes. what we like, it's not just a Don Schuler and Ben Minich. It's those two plus Brandon Hillman. Please continue. Exactly. Right? I just want yep. to get and, some context and, in there. Oh, uh, no, I appreciate the context because there's going to be some people that are going to shake their head and just be like, you lost Peyton Bowen, blah, 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 blah. I'm That's focusing fair. 
on the and it is it is you, you missed out on an elite they're, level player right? and no Xavier Nwangpa last year. That's what yes. fans are focusing on, and it's fair. Yeah. But anyway, continue. I get I get that. I but I still love the three man class that they're able to get because I look at what each one of them brings to the table: Don Schuler, Ben Minish, and Brandon Hillman, and I think that they bring so much different aspects to their games that they are going to fit together incredibly well where I am looking into the future where I'm like, I think that there's a lot of three safety stuff that I could do if all these guys pan out, because you look at a Don shoulder who can do some stuff over the top, but he's more of that short zone, strong safety type. That's going to come down to the box, going to run the alley, work inside out, do some stuff against tight ends combined with Ben minutes, who is more of that true over the top safety. Who's going to work from depth and Brandon Hillman, who I think in spurts could be a rover, could be a dime backer. He could be that type of player where he's more of the true box slot type. And I think that each one of those does things differently where I look at it and say, yes, you missed completely in 2022. There's no – like you didn't get a you didn't get a player, literally. You can't miss more than that, right? Like you didn't get a football player in 2022 at the safety position. Right. But I looked st- that and you only got getting- one in 20. You only have right. one left on the current roster from 2021 and Justin Walters, and he might be a medical mm-hmm. question moving forward. Exactly. So yep. huge numbers need. No that doubt. They, I feel they fell. Wo- That's the thing for me, Ryan. They fell woefully short on numbers. They right? did. Like my B minus has nothing. And you got an F in last year's class because you got no sure. one. That's right. True. Like yeah. I love the three man hall. Like this is what you and I said on when we talk about just 2023. If you uh-huh. if if Notre Dame never would have landed Peyton Bowen, just eh, we, we didn't like him. We think he's going to stay at Oklahoma. We're not going to waste our time there. And all they did was just land a Don Schuler and Ben Minich and Brandon Hillman. I'd I'd be th- I, I love that group. And we gave it a, yes. we gave it a good grade for what it was uh, just as from a talent standpoint. The problem for me, however, is I can't just it's, – it's even it was even worse than receiver because at least at receiver last year you got Tobias Merriweather. Mm-hmm. They got Jaden Bellamy, who was my lowest-ranked player in the class last year, I believe, uh, mm-hmm. and, and, and then that's it. Mm-hmm. And then the year before, all you got was Justin Walters, who's a yeah. nice player but was never going to be a guy. And, and and then the year before that, the only safeties you have left on the roster from the year before that are guys that had to convert from somewhere else, Ramon sure. Henderson and Xavier Watts. Mm-hmm. And so you you needed it. And, and to me, because of those issues, you needed more definite step-in day one players. And I don't know for sure, as much as I love Adon Schuler and Ben I can't say for sure that they're guys that would step in day one and play because they – earned it more so than they're going to have to do that because there's nobody else. Right. That's my concern. Yeah. Like Kurt Heinrich played as a freshman, but he wouldn't have now. Right. Right. He that. would have taken a year that. to develop and he still would have been a fifth year guy, but he wouldn't need COVID to get there. You know what I mean? <laughs> and sure. that's, that's, that's my thing. And that's my concern with safety this year, Ryan is mm-hmm. the, the, the numbers were so bad. You needed someone that could come in and play day one. Mm-hmm. And I just, now maybe they proved me wrong. But can you really like pound on the table and say this guy is a day one player? Now I think Ben Minich and Adon Schuler can play day one if they have mm-hmm. to. Sure. But they're not going to be a position where they're playing because just the minute they step foot on campus, they're that dude. They may get there, but just that as of right now, evaluating them, I just don't think they're there yet. And mm-hmm. and when you consider they got an F last year because they needed at least two safeties last. Like not only did they get like they'd have got one, they still would have been falling short on numbers. They needed two safeties last year and three this year. Mm-hmm. They got their three this year. They went over last year. And yeah. that's where I look at it, Ryan. And I say, man, I just, I kind of felt I was being like, the only reason I gave a B minus was because of how much I like the talent of the 23 right. group. Yeah. Is that, I think for yeah. you, I think you're, you feel like you're punishing the three kids that you like in 23 by going lower than a B plus. That's me uh, looking into your, your site. Yeah. Right. I, I think also because two safety spots, right? A strong safety and a free safety or a boundary safety and a field safety, how Notre Dame plays it. Right. But I think that for me, the reason that it, it didn't quite lower it as much is because of the different 
skill sets that each one of them bring, right, Brian? Like if if two of them were like mirror images of the other, sure. from like that guy is just a backup player. Like that, that's a backup strong safety or a backup free safety. You'll never be able to get all three on the field right. at the same time. I feel like I would be a little more down on the class, but I legitimately right. think that there's going to be an, a, an area down the line where you're like, Adon, Ben, and Brandon Hillman, you're on the field sure. at the same time because they have completely different skills. I think that I just think that's what's saving it for me. It's but like, see, here, here's the thing. Don't yes. disagree with that at all. Yeah. You look at my my safety grade from from this from this year. It's a B. Mm-hmm. B that's a top 10 to 15 group. Mm-hmm. But here's the deal. Who's 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 playing? Who's the depth? What if one of those guys sprains an ankle? Sure. Those guys right now, if they're in a playing a three safety look, they have to play every single snap because you literally have no one else. And that's the thing. That's the that's the issue for me. Where we're talking D line, we're talking about a full two deep on the D line. We're talking about a full, and we're still concerned about things there. We're talking about a full two deep on the offensive line, minus a guy, right? right. <laughs> we're talking about depth and depth. And you running back, you've got a third stringer guy. Tight end, you've got a third stringer guy if you're going to be like 11 personnel. Linebacker, I've got a full two deep at linebacker. You don't mm-hmm. even have a two, a, a two if you're going to talk about three safety looks, to your point. If you're mm-hmm. in a two safety look, you got a rotation guy at one spot. But what if somebody goes down? You're screwed. So that's the whole thing is you keep talking about the 23 class, and I'm yep. with you there. Sure. The problem is you have to if, – if I get an A on one paper and an F on another, I'm a C, <laughs> not a B plus. You know that's what I right. mean? Like that's it's the way weird. I look at it. So I think we're on the same page in 23, well, but I don't know, man, there's some teachers that instead of giving you a zero for an F, they bump you up to a 50, right? So it might balance oh, out a little I'm bit. I'm talking about a 50 because here's the deal. Sure. If, if I'm giving you a zero and you got an a hundred, you're still an F because <laughs> it's a 50. So I'm giving you the 50 and, uh, and, and I'm giving you the 95 and you divide that by two. And that's a 72.5, which is borderline C minus. Mm-hmm, that that mm-hmm. now see to me i'm giving them a 69 i mean i'm, I'm or a 59 <laughs> i'm even being kind that way right i'm giving them a 55 and a 96 is what i'm doing right so i'm i'm and it's still to me it's still a c plus so i mean if we if we are going to look at it from an academic standpoint it's hard for me to get to a b plus because i think I think you don't want to punish this year's group because of the failings of last year. And that's fair. Could be part of it. But yeah. two things about it. Number one, it's the same coach. So you can't mm-hmm. you can't like give them a pass because it's it's the same position coach. Number sure. one. And number two, you know, you wanted guys. It's not like they chose to pass on safeties last year. They just struck out. Right. You right. know, and then lose that. Devin Moore late, took another potential safety out of the quick question because he might have been able to move over to safety. <sighs> that would have been nice. That and that's the nice. thing for me that hurts it. So yeah, that's that's why I'm gonna go there, Ryan. I know you gotta you gotta get going, so I'm gonna talk about corners next, and then we have a couple super chats we're gonna answer as well. Ryan, you want to wish everybody Merry Christmas or whatever before uh, before we go? Yes, yes. I was gonna put a nice message on the board at some point either today or tomorrow, but I hope everybody out there, Irish Breakdown Nation, have a merry Merry Christmas if you celebrate, but have happy holidays regardless. So I'm gonna jump into the cornerback breakdowns now, and and this is an interesting group because. If you'd have told me three years ago that we'd be talking about Notre Dame recruiting the cornerback position the way that they have the last two years, I'd have said you're out of your mind because it just it was a position we had never really seen this. I think the last time that you could argue that Notre Dame recruited the cornerback position like to an A level in two years in a row, and even then I think they were a guy short in 07, was in 06 when they got Darren Walls and Rayshon McNeil, who Rayshon McNeil was a top 100 guy. Darren Walls was as well. Uh, and then uh, 2007, they got Gary Gray, who was a top 100 recruit. That was pretty good. You still came up a guy short, though. You look at the last two years, and again, this grade on corner is based on what we had guys coming out of high school. So for me, I had Benjamin Morrison as a top 100 player with five-star upside. I, I, again, he was even better than I thought he was going to be, but he was still a top 100 corner with five-star upside for me. Loved Benjamin Morrison coming out of high school. Jaden Mickey was a top 150 guy for me. And then you look at this year's class and Micah Bell and Christian Gray, both great out as top 100 guys for me. Now, Micah Bell was, a, or excuse me, um, Christian Gray was a top 150 guy for me coming into his senior season. So if if he would have stayed there, I probably would have given this an A minus grade. But I loved his senior film, especially being able to watch him against, because like here was the concern I had for Christian Gray. He's just, 
And I knew it was a concern and, and, it, and I knew I could have been wrong on it because he's so long and smooth and fluid that it almost kind of masks how well he runs. And one of the things that I had brought up to people you know, when they first got him is I said, I know he's run fast times, but I don't know if I see that kind of speed on film. It was just harder for me to evaluate. And some kids are just like that. I'm going to be honest about that. But it was just kind of hard for me to really see that 441, 442 speed. That's where watching him this year go against Aaron Scott from Ohio, watching him go against Ryan Wingo, watching him go against Jeremiah McClellan, watching him go against Cardinal Tate, you're going to watch him against other guys who you're like, okay, that guy can run. I know that guy can run. And Christian is, is as every bit as fast, if not faster than that guy. You know, you're watching Jeremiah Love run up for a long touchdown run against DeSmet, and then all of a sudden you see Christian Gray just come flying onto the screen, like almost caught him. And you're like, okay, yep, I can see it now. And so then watching him just really just be so sticky in coverage against really good players week after week after week, watching him fill out his frame a little bit, he jumped into the into the top 100 category for me. So three top 100 corners in two years, another top 150 guy in Jaden Mickey, is as good as you're going to see. And then three of the four corners had five-star upside grades for me. The only one that didn't is Mickey. And so that's as, I mean, that's as good as you're going to get. I absolutely love this talent. Micah Bell is arguably the fastest player in high school football. He's certainly in the top five. Christian Gray is was timed at Notre Dame's camp and at Ohio State's camp as 4 4 or faster. And then, of course, we saw – you know, Benjamin Morrison, who was a guy that I thought was a big time player coming out of high school, uh, he's turned out to be pretty good so far. But again, that doesn't factor into the grade. And then Jaden Mickey's a guy that to me was as polished as all of them, if not more so. So I absolutely love what they're doing at corner this year's class. I think it's it's got speed, it's got length, it's got playmaking ability, it's got high football IQs at most spot spots. You got guys that were two-way standouts. Micah Bell, obviously, being a thousand-yard running back the, each of the last two years. Christian Gray played a lot of receiver for DeSmet. Uh, Benjamin Morrison played some some receiver in high school. The only guy that I don't remember playing a lot of offense was Jaden Mickey, who was a punt returner. So three of the four guys are two-way players, and and I think that they're just outstanding players. I think this is this is as good of a of a back-to-back corner recruiting as I've seen. I mean, you'd have to go back to like 90, like 90, 91, 92 when they were getting like you know, Tom Carter. And and uh, I'm going to try to find that article that Lou Samoji did because I think Tom Carter and Jeff Burris were the same class. Uh, and I know Lou Samoji had written an article about um, – the. oh, here we go. I found this article. So let's see the number. It's the 1990 class. Uh, let's see here. The defensive back, you had uh, Jeff Burris, Tom Carter, Greg Lane, John Covington, Willie Clark, Lashane Sadler. So, yeah, you had Tom Carter and Jeff Burris. Now, Jeff Burris was signed as a running back corner. He ended up moving to safety, but he was there. And then I think the 1991 class, I believe, had Bobby Taylor in it. Uh, I, I, I believe he was in that class. And then, of course, they followed Tom Todd Light, who was signed in the 87 class. Like, Notre Dame was just signing dudes every year corner back then. And, of course, now you went through a long period where that just wasn't happening. You had that nice little two years a bit in 06 and 07. But then by Charlie Weiss's last year, like, his only corner signee in 09 was, like, EJ Banks. Like, it fell off quickly. But now you've seen Mike Mickens kind of do it pretty good first years. You know, the, the Ryan Barnes – Chance Tucker, Philip Riley class, I still like. I liked it coming out of high school, and it was impressive that he was able to do it without being able to get on the road. Remember, that was during the COVID year when they couldn't go on visits and kids couldn't visit them. They had to do all of that remotely. That was a phenomenal recruiting job by him that year to be able to do those guys as a first-year coach at Notre Dame. Then he follows that up with Benjamin Morrison and Jade Mickey, which is an outstanding cornerback tandem. And then you followed up this year, which what might – coming out of high school might be even in a better group than the one last year. If you if you look at the four corners for me and how I grade them coming out of high school, looking at my grade, Benjamin Morrison is one, Micah Bell is two, Christian Gray is three, because I factor in upside. If you're going to go based off who they are now, then Gray is two and Bell is three, but I factor in the upside grade in my overall grade. 
And then number four is Jaden Mickey. The gap between Mickey and number three is, is greater than the gap between Morrison and number two, whichever way you look at it. So you could argue that this year's class, even though neither of them are as good, in my view, as Morrison, that their ceilings are every bit as high. And as a duo, they're even better than the Mickey Morrison group. Some of you be, could push back on me on that, and that's totally fine. But the fact that you may want to push back on it is exactly why this is such a great two-year haul because you could make a case that last year's cornerback tandem is better if you were someone who believed, like I believed, that Benjamin Morrison was a top 100 recruit. So just the job that they've done in these last two years at recruiting the cornerback position is outstanding. And as we talked about before, this, is, this could ultimately be the saving grace for the safety position. Because you still, if you're able to keep Chance Tucker and Ryan Barnes and Philip Riley, or at least you just need two of them to stay, combined with this four man haul, whether it be Ryan Barnes from that class, whether it be Cl Clarence Lewis from the previous class, because he could, he gets his 2020 year back, even though he played 2020, that COVID year. So Clarence could spend two years at safety, Barnes could spend multiple years at safety. The fact that you've re recruited such outstanding corners and you got two each year the last two years now protects you numbers wise it allows you to then look to your other corners a Clarence Lewis perhaps a Ryan Barnes and say hey we're now going to move you to safety because we think you can go be a, an impact a difference maker there a guy that could start there a guy that could play there either one of those two guys now all of a sudden your safety position is looking a lot better because you're able to move one of those guys and not miss a beat because of how well you've recruited the last two years plus having a chance Tucker and if you keep a Ryan Barnes there and move Clarence Lewis or if you move Ryan Barnes to keep Clarence Lewis all of a sudden you're loaded at corner to the point where you can lose a guy to safety and not not even blink about it because it's like hey if anything it's good because now we're you know because Clarence Lewis is a good football player I just don't think he's a great fit at corner in this defense I think Clarence Lewis and Bob Diaco's defense would have been really good I really believe that uh, you know more zone more cover two play some cover four you know play the post a little bit but in a defense that wants you to come out and just play man I just don't think that's his deal you put him at safety however and all of a sudden I think he becomes a, a really good football player and 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 a guy that could be a difference maker and a guy that could play at the next level in my view as a safety I don't think he can as a corner so now all of a sudden, because you've recruited corner so well, you have the opportunity. Now, I don't know if they'll do it or not, but I think they should. You have the opportunity to move somebody to safety that could be an even better player there. So the corner recruiting, and it could in turn make the safety position even stronger. And I think that's a huge, huge part of this. So um, I, I just – huge shout-out to Mike Mickens for the job he's done the last two years. Uh, he has he just really just crushed it. And, and he's found – like they haven't had to take any chances – you know, corners can be uh, personality wise can be a little different and uh, and be more about me, 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 me. Let's just be real. That's been true for decades. They found kids that are I mean, you listen to Benjamin Morrison talk and you're like you watch him play and you're like, this kid has swagger. He talks trash. He's a great playmaker. He's an outstanding player. Jaden Mickey's just constantly yapping at people. Uh, you know, Christian Gray talks a lot of trash. Micah Bell doesn't. But the other three do. Then you meet them and you're like, they've got such a different personality off the field. Benjamin Morrison's like this really intelligent, thoughtful kid. Jaden Mickey is just this really nice, um, smart kid. Christian Gray is just this like silly, and I mean silly in a in a positive way, just like this really like goofy, silly, lighthearted kid with this really just fun outgoing personality that, that doesn't look anything like you'd think a big time corner should act. Uh, you know, Micah Bell's this high IQ, high intellect, really thoughtful uh, kid that like had offers from like Harvard and these Ivy league schools that are wanting them. And you're like, that's not the typical personality for corners, but they're elite football players and elite young men. And they're great fits for Notre Dame. Micah, uh, Mike Mickens and this staff, have done such a tremendous job of not only identifying great talent, but kids that fit Notre Dame really, really well. And that that might be the position where that's hardest to do, which even adds more to just the phenomenal job that Mike Mickens has done at this position the last two years. So huge, huge kudos to Mike Mickens. So that's going to kind of wrap up 
just our breakdown of this class and and just how we view this class. I think like Ryan and I both agree this is an A minus group overall the last two years. Uh, that last year's class to me was in the five to seven range. This year's class is in the top five range. I don't care where everybody else ranks it. I really don't. Uh, I view it as a top five class. I've and I went through this with a buddy of mine. You know, we went through LSU's class, we went through Miami's class, Oklahoma's class, Oregon's class, Texas's class. All these classes are ranked at Notre Dame's, and in some spots they are better uh, than Notre Dame is, but in other spots, you know, Notre Dame is significantly better, and those classes all have some kind of holes. Thank you so much. My wife just brought me some hot cocoa. So uh, she, with marshmallows, by the way. So she Christmas abso- Eve show. You're she, allowed to yes, have hot cocoa. she absolutely rocks right now. <laughs> absolutely rocks. So perfect timing. That's why I told y'all. I, I told y'all yesterday. Uh, best thing never happened to me is that lady right there. Uh, so in uh, so anyway, so you look at this class. I think it's an it's a flat out a needle moving class. Are they there yet? Completely. No, they're not. They've got to get more consistent recruiting quarterback. They've got to make sure that they're not missing the numbers. I would like for them to eventually not be taking so many injury risks with high ceilings at certain spots. Uh, defensive line wise, maybe some more ready to make ready made players. Uh, safety, they can't keep missing at that position. Like, to Ryan's point, if they recruit this type of three man class every year or just two of these three, no names have great safety play. Great safety play. I'm not someone who necessarily believes that you need elite safeties. There was a guy. Uh, on our board the other day, uh, terrible TR. He made this point, and 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 I'm just going to kind of paraphrase it because I don't remember exactly what he said. What he, but he basically was like, you don't win championships because you have elite safeties. You win championships because you have elite front seven players, and that's true. If you're really good in the front seven and you've got great corners, which Notre Dame has recruited all those positions very well, and you've just got good football players to safety, you're going to have an elite defense. That's just that's just the reality of it. So I love the kids they got at safety. It's just you've got to do it consistently. Like if you can give me a Ben Minich and a Don Schuler and Brandon Hillman at safety every year, I mean Notre Dame's going to have great safety play, especially if they keep recruiting those other positions. So again, not there yet, but they're so much closer now because what they've done th- this last two years is they've been able to hit their needs numbers wise more often than not, and that's why this class was so good because. It hit at numbers, three safeties in one class is a lot. That's good. It, four receivers is really good. You can't go much further than that because then you start getting too many players in one class. So they really took good first steps towards meeting their needs in this class. Now you got to follow it up with a, a 2024 class that doesn't have the holes that the 2022 class had. You can argue the 2022 class had more elite level players. I, I wouldn't necessarily make that argument, but you can argue it. But what you can't argue is the bottom half of this class is so much deeper and better than the bottom half of last year's class, in my view. And that's very, very important. And and that's what makes this such a great class, in my opinion. But even in a two-year view, it's just really excellent recruiting. Now, next year, hit those consistent marks. Keep getting good running backs, which they've already had. Give me another strong receiver class. Keep recruiting the tight end position well. Keep meeting your needs on the offensive line. Maybe get some more high ceiling or high floor guys on the defensive line as well as high ceilings. Keep doing what you're doing at corner. Keep doing what you're doing at linebacker. Those things are all important. And and then start meeting some of your other needs in those other areas. So I absolutely love what Notre Dame's doing. I think there's a couple areas where Coach Freeman's got to pay attention to what guys are doing as recruiters and either – you know, tell them to get better uh, or tell them to find somebody else. I mean, that's something you you, you need to do. I'm first say, hey, let's try to get them better. Uh, but if they can't get better, then you, you need to find somebody else. Because Freeman has said, you got to be able to recruit and coach at an elite level to be here at Notre Dame. And some guys are not doing either. I don't think Al Washington is doing either right now. I think Chris O'Leary is at least coaching really well. He's got to start recruiting better. But this is a good first start with the Don Schuller, Ben Minich. And then you have a stud like Chad Bode who can go out and find a Brandon Hillman and then supplement what C- Coach O'Leary has done. That's how it's supposed to be. I, the, Chris O'Leary during the season had to go out and coach. So that's why you have a Chad Bowden to go out and find a Brandon Hillman. That's why he should be here and he should be getting paid and he should be getting paid even more for the job that he has done. And, and so I love what they're doing. Now it's just about keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. That's going to be the key. 
So before we get out of here, we do have some super chats that I want to get to, and I really appreciate those. Uh, we're not going to do a mailbag today uh, because I just we, I have things to do. Ryan had a Christmas party to get to. I got to go, you know, uh, spend some time with my wife who just brought me some hot cocoa, uh, which is very very sweet of her. But I did want to get to the super chats from y'all, and and before we before we head out of here, Detro Hunter, with a super chat, thank you, sir. Merry Christmas to all. John Monty with a super chat, thank you, John. Great shows. Keep up the great work. Merry Christmas to you, gentlemen. Thank you very, very much, John. Trevor Rocket with another super chat, with a super chat. Thank you, Trevor, very, very much. Merry Christmas Eve. IB Nation from Drayton, Ontario, Canada. Keep up the great work, lads. Looking forward to seeing the program get back to O-line U status. I agree. And I love the fact how many Canadians we have on this show. It's it's really fascinating um, that, that we have so many. And welcome, our northern brethren, John Bertucci. Thank you, John, with a super chat. Merry Christmas. Same to you, John. Thank you very much for your super chat. Milton Fan uh, 2.0 says, do you like Notre Dame moving uh, the best linebackers to edge? Not sure if we addressed that earlier, so I'm going to say that now. I'm actually a big fan of that. I love finding Josh Burnham's, and if they stick at linebacker, great. If they don't, move them to the edge. I'm a big fan of that. Big fan of that, uh, especially at Notre Dame where they're just going to have a hard time. Notre Dame's always going to have a hard time convincing a kid like Damon Wilson to come to come to Notre Dame. They're always going to have a hard time on that. That's just never going to be something they're going to consistently do. There aren't many Keon Keeley types out there that are such good fits for Notre Dame, and they still couldn't get Keon. Ke- I've said this before. Keon Keeley was about as much of a Notre Dame kid as you're going to find anywhere in the country, especially in the state of Florida, and they still couldn't get him. So what you've got to do is you've got to go find the Josh Burnhams. You've got to go get those kind of guys who can grow into defensive ends. Justin Tuck was recruited as a linebacker and grew into a defensive end. So I think that's where they're going to have to go. I think that's going to have to continue to be a strategy for Notre Dame is find those 6'4", 215-pound kids with great frames that have some explosiveness that you think you can convert to, to edge players or say, hey, look, we just can't get those guys, so maybe this three three five thing is where we need to go because we can recruit the Burnhams and the two Alamacas and the Patelhos, who kind of fit that three three five as a linebacker hybrid guy more so than the Isaiah Foskies, who was Notre Dame got, but they just don't consistently get that kind of guy. And so I think that's a big part of it. And then we have a super chat from Derek Calmer. Thank you so much, Derek. Merry Christmas. Here's to an incredible 2023. Appreciate the IB staff. Go enjoy your families. Derek, thank you very, very much for that. Merry Christmas to you as well. And then we have a football question here from Trevor Rocket. He says, thank you again for another Super Chat, Trevor. He says, guys, do you think Michael Carmody is a sleeper at guard next season uh, or has been passed up by some of the younger players? Definitely a now or never like Tosh Baker as well. He could be a factor. I mean, Michael Carmody is a good football player. There's no doubt about it. I just – my big concern for him, honestly, is he he's down to like 280 and he looks really skinny. And I just wonder if he's able to add the weight that he needs to play the offensive line. That's that's a. I have the same concern with J- Caleb Johnson. Is there? There's just too many guys in some of the older classes that just have. They're just not guys that can add natural weight. And that's why I get a little nervous about Emil Emil Wagner. It's not every kid can do that. Some can, not every kid can. And I think that's just an issue that Michael has had. If he can get to 285, 290, and hold it and hold his water there and. And, uh, and be able to play with power. Sure, he could be a factor there. But I do believe the one thing I'm sure of is this is a now or never moment for him as a starter. If he gets beat out by by Rocco Spindler, who's younger than him, if he gets beat out by a Billy Shrouth, who's younger than him, uh, somebody like that, then, yeah, he's going to he's gonna have a tough time getting the starting lined up. You know, so it, it's – and then you've got Jagasaw coming in and, and Sullivan Absher and Sam Pendleton coming in. So he's going to have to kind of seize hold of it now if he's going to have a chance to make it. So – yeah, it's a very, very good question. And could he be a sleeper? Yeah, he could. I like Michael Carmody, but he's going to have to get some weight on and and be able to, to do it now or it's not going to happen. That's going to do it for today's show, everybody. Thank you all so much for being with us. We're not done to the end of the year. We'll be back on Monday for a show, but I want to wish everybody out there a very Merry Christmas. We're going to we're going to get ready for this bowl game. And then after the bowl game, we're going to have a really, really, really fun 2023. We're going to, you know, kind of a lot of different things planned. And and it's just been such an amazing year. It's been incredibly busy and a lot of hard work, but it's so worth it uh, to be able to see the community that we've built and just the family that we have here at Irish Breakdown. I can't tell you how much I appreciate 
the community that we have. It's not just, I mean, yeah, we, we're doing well. Our company's grown. We're doing well. That's all great. But it's so much more fun to grow and expand and do all these things when you have such great people that we're a part of. I mean, it's Christmas Eve and we have over 250 people in the chat. Like, seriously, you all are amazing. I, I love you all so much. I truly mean that. We have a great community. We have a guy reaching out the other day. He's having heart failure problems. He asked me if, if, if I can put a prayer request on the board. The fact that you're in the he's in the hospital dealing with heart failure, and he wants his Irish Breakdown family to pray for him. I just love the group. of, And he knows that they we will. I just love the group that we're building. Um, we've got Michigan fans in here, Ohio State fans in here, Alabama fans in here, and we're all just uh, – I love this family, and I can't thank you all enough for what you've helped me build because you guys are there with me on this. And it's been so much fun, and I appreciate you all so very much. So have a merry, merry Christmas and a happy holidays to all of you. Um, and thank you for being with us. Sign up for the message board, everybody. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe. Hit that notification bell. Sign up to make sure you are subscribing to our podcast as well at Irish Breakdown, which you can find on all your podcast apps and the CFB Nation one. We have some new videos out on CFB Nation. I've cut up all the interviews individually that we did on signing day. So if you if you couldn't make it through the whole five-hour-plus show, I cut up each one of the individual interviews. I put that on the IB or Irish Breakdown YouTube channel. I'm going to put them into sort of one article here coming up here soon as well for the site. I have some probes coming up on my class rankings either tonight or tomorrow. I'm going to have my Christmas, the article I do every year, my Irish Breakdown, my Notre Dame Christmas wish list. I'll have that out tomorrow as well. Uh, but everybody, be safe. Enjoy the time with your family. And thank you all so much for who you are and, and what you've helped us do and what you've helped me do and the community that we've built. Have a Merry Christmas. We'll talk to you again on the Irish Breakdown Podcast.